computer. Hey, what's up, everyone tuning into the podcast? We're on To Live a Lie podcast number five, and we have a very special guest today. We've got Max Ward from 625 Thrashcore slash Spaz slash What Happens Next slash Scholastic Death. Uh, that's probably what most people know you from. Uh, say hello to everyone, Max. Hello, hello. Happy to be here and stoked <laughs> to uh, talk about music, both from the past and currently. Awesome. Uh, also, we got CJ and Eli here. Uh, if y'all want to say something and CJ uh, introduce yourself, that'd be great. Cool. Uh, CJ, live in Raleigh. I'm in Leachate, Locust Rain, Shirley Road Records. And uh, yeah, happy to be here. Fuck yeah. What's up? I'm Eli. Uh, you know, I'm from the band Tired of Everything with Will and uh I'm also happy to be here and I love hardcore and yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I'm gonna put Max on the spot because you mentioned our band. I think Max has actually said that he's listened to us. So oh, yeah, I've, I've seen, yeah, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen some live, live footage. I wanted oh, cool. to see Will in action. Oh yeah. Hell yeah. 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 So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Hopefully I'm, I'm hoping once we're through the other side of this pandemic that, uh, you know, maybe I'll be able to see you guys live or something. Maybe even come down and visit or something. That would be, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I'm going to go ahead and jump in questions just because also talking about this and thinking about live videos of our band, like it was me being usually a bass player since I started playing in bands at 16. It was a awkward transition to, I mean, I approached Eli and Ryan and was like, Hey, like I want to be in y'all's band. And I think Ryan thought I was trying to be a bass player. And I'm like, no, like, I want to try singing. I, Max, when you signed up to do Scholastic Death, I don't know if you were asked or if you uh, exactly how that happened, but was it awkward to be a drummer that became oh, a yeah. singer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I tried. I sang before in a band uh, that was called Evolved to Obliteration. And they had a singer. So basically I've always been kind of um, the person who comes in with a band that's been active and they lose their singer and they become inactive. And I just kind of offered to, you know, help out or whatever. And so with <clears throat> ETO that happened, they lost their original singer, Mateo. And he was perfect for the band. They, they did the split with, uh, he recorded uh, this, the tracks that were, that came out on the no less ETO split, which is 65 number one. He was great and uh, I can't remember what happened if there was a falling out or he just decided to leave and so I offered because I had been singing with Spaz in the studio you know it was like because we had three vocals every time we uh, recorded but live it was only Chris and Dan so I was like oh okay I can do this and then you know doing it live I was like I don't think I can do this <laughs> you know like, <laughs> like I blow out my voice you know like two songs yeah. in and yep. just yeah i mean and like have awkward stage presence because i was so comfortable behind a drum kit you know but then all of a sudden like i'm out in front i'm like oh shit what do i do with my hands you know and like uh, <laughs> and then with with scholastic it was the same thing it was they i had met all the guys they were looking for a practice space i had a practice space with like it was three drum sets shared the practice space and around those three drum sets there was all these bands so we could everybody could split rent you know and so b wanted to bring his drums in there and they and start practicing there and so they played one time and i was like holy shit like why aren't you guys playing and they just they couldn't find a singer you know and so i was like well this is probably a bad idea but you know i can try out or something you know and uh and still even with that band uh I don't really like the sound of my vocals and I never felt comfortable playing live, you know, but, uh, you know, I was, I was honored to be able to play with both bands, ETO and Scholastic Death. They, they get, gave me the opportunity to do that, but I never really felt comfortable singing. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, think, I think Raleigh's a great place to come up. Well, Ah, uh, Will muted himself. Uh oh. Oh, Will. <laughs> You're leaving us all hanging. 
rally and being... <laughs> let me let me text him. Well, I guess in the meantime, me and Eli can pick up where Will left off because we're from Raleigh. Well, <laughs> well, yeah. can you all hear me yet? Oh yeah, 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 yeah now we can. Hey. Yeah, I've been having some weird computer you. issues. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, right. so you were just saying? Uh, it, you, you, yeah, you said you cut off at, at you said Raleigh. Raleigh is a good place to come up, and then you came. You uh, you cut out. <laughs> well having like the bunker is like so we've got raleigh usually has some kind of mainstay of a house show culture here yeah like, definitely showed up for you yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll mute right now just so it doesn't bother but yeah so small shows like making it a little more comfortable to kind of yeah like our first show was a venue show but it's we played at slims which is a uh, I mean, I played bass at Slums plenty of times. It's got like a, a like a three inch stage, and it's just like the shotgun hallway of a venue. Um, yeah. It's intimidating to play the first time, but luckily, like y'all gave me a lot of time to get comfortable at the very start of it. And uh, definitely, yeah. I didn't feel any pressure for us to go and uh, play right away. We actually recorded before we played live and did a really good recording which was good for my my memory like i did I, I i try to do scratch tracks uh just to have recordings to like listen to and get the the timber of singing down because i'm not used to singing uh, but having those nice clean recordings was like okay this is just like singing along to your favorite record like like I can hear and it's clear. We yeah, went with Chris yeah. Hilbert and it sounded great. Definitely. Um, so the first band I was in, I have a story about it's kind of related to Spaz. So um, <laughs> it, uh, so we were okay. So my my friends Ace and Darius, they wanted to start a a power violence band, and that's what I was into at the time. And they were like, all right, we're going to be called Mad Dog. And I was like, okay. Uh, it, sick. Yeah, well, I was, I was thinking, uh, are you talking about like the, you know, 211 or what, <laughs> you know? And they're like, no, no, because they didn't drink at the time. Um, and they're like, no, we got it from this, <laughs> from this spaz song. And it's, uh, I actually, hold on. I wrote the, the name of the song down. Hold on a sec. It's, uh, it's Street Jam to the Second Power. Okay. There, there's this fucking there's this this sound clip where it's like is your child uh you know you like showing signs of of gang culture oh, yeah, yeah you know this and that does he go by names like chico uh something mad yeah. dog and so yeah that's where we got that name but uh yeah good stuff but um our our first show was actually behind a warehouse an abandoned warehouse in raleigh so yeah will is right about there's always been like a culture of you know house shows and just shows at weird spots i guess you know yeah was that the very illegal show that ira put together that the cap cops <laughs> came out and laughed at us yes yep. yeah <laughs> and the new there was a band from new york that played and they were neutrino they rats got, Neutron yeah, ne neutron yeah yeah neutron rats they they were not super stoked <laughs> about that <laughs> i don't blame them but you know it yeah, happens I, th I think you know like speaking of like scholastic death and that experience like we played one of our first shows like on the gilman stage gilman <clears throat> isn't oh, actually a very yeah. big big club or anything and and the stage isn't very big and the crowd's just kind of right there but i felt super uncomfortable and like and i don't think the show was very very good our show wasn't very good i mean the rest of the show was fine but yeah um and then I learned, and they would allow smaller bands to play in the store. And the store is like literally the size of probably just this room. You can maybe cram 20 people in their tops, you know? And so we would play on the floor and, and that felt so much more natural, you know, because like yeah. I would just be fate. The drums would be right here and the crowd would like, literally, I could feel them breathing on me, you know? And that felt more yeah. comfortable than like being on this stage and like having, you know, heads here, you know, where right. You're, it just it felt felt so weird but yeah i mean it's it's like those floor shows basement shows 
generator shows th those feel more comfortable yeah I, yeah because you don't have a choice you don't have a choice of you're just you're all packed together but sorry yeah. what were you saying will <clears throat> oh we've been on some big stages and i've surprisingly not hated it like uh uh what's the big venue downtown we played um, um maywood no we played oh, uh, poor house poor house which is um definitely not built for bands like us like it's a big stage but i think the the bright lights of real venues may, like melt my stress away a little bit because i it's the like seeing in people's eyes and like <laughs> when someone's just like looking at you not like this like excited just like just like you, they got like a beer and they're like uh, yeah. like they're just mm -hmm. there the, the moment just i like... see one person looking at me like 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 this <laughs> i'm just like so pissed <laughs> it's happened at the bunker before because uh, i mean house show like the house show doesn't pop off for the first couple bands a lot of yeah the time. so you're just like watching these people and you're like these are some riffs right here like i'm jumping in this tiny room trying to like get the energy yeah. up and y'all are just standing around yeah yeah i definitely i don't know i i was young when i did vocals so I remember there were certain shows where I would just go so crazy that I don't really remember if the crowd was awkward or not because I just had so much energy. But then there were other shows where I definitely remember the crowd not being into it. Yeah. And you're playing blast beat music and it's really fucking awkward. <laughs> C CJ, what, what do you play? You, you said you were playing in a bunch of bands. I never asked what, um, what you do. Yeah, so... Um... I've had two bands before the one I'm in. I had like a little high school band that never did anything. Um, my first band that had a name was based out of Boone, North Carolina. Uh, we were called Ragweed and we actually shared a member of one of Will's old bands, um, the singer for Occident. The current, and in that one I did uh, guitar. Current band, Leech 8, I do um, guitar, vocals. Um, I would say... I write the majority of the lyrics, but most of our lyrics are a lot of oohs, ahs, woes, and yas, you know? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you feel comfortable? Do you feel more comfortable like having a guitar and singing into a mic rather than like if you were completely just with the mic in your hand kind of? I haven't had a band where I'm doing just vocals, but I have done performances on just vocals. And honestly, I like it more. Um, <laughs> I've never been able to like do vocals and play guitar well. I definitely can't sing and play, but like yelling and playing is easier because it's all rhythmic. Um, but I just like not having to wear a guitar so I can do dumber shit basically. Like definitely like get in, engage with the crowd. Um, we had a show in Wilmington um, at this venue kind of near downtown that it was a hookah lounge and the oh, ceiling lounge, had like that's metal, awesome. <laughs> yeah the ceiling had like metal like a metal beam so i was like i bet i can climb up there and hold the mic with my teeth <laughs> <laughs> um it's got a little bit harder to do that when you play guitar you know yeah yeah definitely um, <laughs> yeah, yeah play, you know playing drums the whole time you got the best seat in the house because you get to see the show going off you get to see the the crowd interacting with the band and I would always be sitting there and I'm, you know, trying to keep everything together because you're kind of holding everybody together as they're moving around and stuff. And I was like, man, I want to do that. You know, I want to like interact with the crowd, you know, I'm like kind of trapped back here. And, and then once I did it, I was like, Oh shit. You know, yeah. like, I want to get behind my drums again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, it's just really fun. Just like putting the mic in kids faces. Cause they know the words. I was like, ah, oh, man, I, I feel so cool right now. <laughs> The all 10 people watching my band i feel so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah I dude can... oh yeah go ahead no you go you go max yeah i was gonna say like with with scholastic death you know we came out of the bay area and so and there was tons of bands and there's tons of bands in los angeles as well but there was just such a tight-knit scene down there in in la that <clears throat> uh they're they kind of like kind of hyped on us and we were we were like whoa the, like people know us and people know our lyrics and so we would we would support bands so i was bringing bands from japan over in the early 2000s and driving up and down the coast and so you'd always have to have a band on tour so they had equipment like a backline you know to use 
And so whether it was like what happens next or Scholastic Death. And so Scholastic Death went on uh, the road with uh, Lai from nice. Japan. And we went <clears throat> down to LA and we didn't know what to expect. We just thought like this was going to be our exposure to LA. And sure enough, they all knew the lyrics. Like the, everybody had memorized all the lyrics of the first EP and I couldn't believe it, you know? And so it made it so yeah. much easier because I could stop singing and I could just <laughs> like, you know, hold out the mic and people knew the lyrics. And so that that's that was my only... You know, it was really in LA that people like really, uh, you know, got super proactive and like involved with with the with the band and stuff like that. So that uh, I, I hear you with that as far as like having that kind of excitement of you know when there's tr truly interaction, like when the when the crowd is actually singing the song for you. You know, you're like, that's awesome. Feel on top of the world. Yeah. Just, yeah. Like, eight seconds. Yeah. 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 It's it awesome. Is. Yeah, it is. It really is, man. You know, most of the time I'm on the other side of that, right? You know, like I'm like trying to climb over people's shoulders to get to the mic or something, yeah. you know, you know, and then know. all of a sudden. Me too. That's the, what I want to make it do. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time someone, well, speaking of stages, I kind of, we, uh, my, my band, I was on vocals in Mad Dog. We played maybe like one stage show, but I remember somebody fucking stage dove. And that was a very nice feeling for me at yeah. the age of 17, you know, I was <laughs> like, man, that rules. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I would have to say that playing drums is a lot easier than uh, doing vocals. Cause every time I would get off stage or off the done with a set, I would always feel like I was about to throw up yeah. for a good 10 minutes afterwards, you yeah. know, well, sometimes yeah. I did. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like Ricky from Shitstorm and Torch, I'm pretty sure every I was single Shitstorm show him. I saw, he threw up after it. Really? Yeah, like dude, he, that guy he's a seasoned has, drummer. <laughs> that guy has maniac vocals. You're talking about the vocalist? No, I'm talking about the drummer. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I could see that too because he's a maniac drummer. <laughs> yeah, with, but with fuck, I love that band. With B from Scholastic Death, we we used to try and push him a lot, you know, like have have sets where there was no stopping between songs and stuff. And so then somebody had a heart monitor, so we so we had the heart monitor on his wrist and connected to get his you know heart rate and stuff and see how high we could get it for one show. <laughs> and then he, one show, it was a Gilman store show, so it, again it was like no ventilation in the corner of this, you know, club with packed with people and stuff. And he was in a unit, like, a, I guess it's called a unitard. Like it's like literally just a one piece <laughs> thing that you put on. That's even got like a little space for the, for the face. And so he wore this yeah. blue unitard and played and yeah, he threw up afterwards, you know, like yeah. he got so overheated and like was having heat stroke basically <laughs> that before he even broke down his drums, he just went out to the corner and was like, you know, puking into a drain and stuff. And, and that's that's when we're like, you know, actually this is kind of dangerous maybe. Like, yeah. <laughs> Trying try to push it too a much. Great idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, here's a way that makes uh, it a small world. I can't remember this. This was in our pre-discussion, but uh, CJ, you brought up the Maywood earlier being one of your favorite venues. And uh, B definitely played uh, at the Maywood before maybe like four or five years ago when uh, No Static was on tour. Nice. So that, that makes the world a little smaller. Um, there you yeah, go. and B's playing in so many bands now, man. No Static and you know, just a, a gazillion bands. He's got a bunch of side projects still going. Yeah. They, this is the drummer of Scholastic Death that you guys yeah. are talking about? Okay, yeah, yeah. cool. I didn't, I didn't know uh, they were in um, No Static as well. That's awesome. Yeah, he's doing. He he filled in for um, Iron Lung had a bunch of shows, and you know Jensen nice. has been having some like wrist problems. Oh no! Oh damn! Yeah, so he that that's why I don't know if like there was a couple photos floating around on like social media of Jensen just singing with gloves oh, okay. on and stuff, and so everybody was like, "Well, what's going on with that?" And B was B filled in for Iron Lung, so they they did two shows, and it's. You know, it's it's pretty wild to hear him playing with a band that is so distinct because of Jensen's drums. Yeah, and, like, and B brought like B totally brought it, man. Like it was, it was pretty yeah. good. So he he's kind of like the go-to. Like if you want to play like fast, simple, barbaric, 
kind of like <laughs> hardcore like everybody goes to be now which is awesome hell yeah I got another small world mention. Uh, uh, Joe from ANS, I think, had bought your drum set at one point, and he also drove bands as he owned that as the back line. So the 625 drum set has played in Raleigh in house shows and venues and basements many times as a strange <laughs> uh, small world thing. Yeah, I didn't even know that was a thing. You know, I gave I gave that drum set to this guy, Carl, who was in, uh, him and I did a side project called Mindless Mutant, and, but he was in a band called Our Turn, like a straight edge youth crew band from San Francisco. And he, he went on to do a couple other bands, but he wanted to learn to play drums. So I gave him the drum set. And I guess that's how a &S got it. And like, maybe you know, after moving away from the Bay Area and I was in graduate school, every, I would randomly meet people and they'd be like, dude, I played your drum set. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> you know, like, what are you talking about, man? You know, like I had no idea what they were mm -hmm. talking about. And then I found out that the play fast or die uh, drum set, like it was just a little beater, you know, Tama that I bought for tour. It was like, I bought it for maybe like 400 bucks or something. And it was, a, and it was particularly because of what happens next, because that whole band uses the kick drum as a launch to jump, you know? So I was like, oh, this drum set's gonna fucking collapse and like, <laughs> you know, like halfway through tour, I'll be I'll be happy if it if it survives, you know? I mean, it went on, what, 20 years? I still meet people or people are getting me on Instagram saying, yo, I played your drum set. You know, I'm like, Jesus Christ, that's gotten a lot of mileage. That's awesome. Yeah, that is cool. The brotherhood wow. of the traveling drums yeah basically yeah, it is. <laughs> eli i'm pretty sure they played a nice price show at some point at some point oh really i can't remember what show it was but i feel like i feel like it played there i don't know what you're talking about no static no the 625 drum set <laughs> oh gotcha okay yeah i could see that that would make sense <laughs> um i got another north carolina related question for you uh I think before my time in Raleigh, Spaz played in Greenville, North Carolina. Dude, one of the best shows on tour, man. Oh, sick. That's yeah. what I hear, but like our feeling of Greenville, or at least my ideas of Greenville, it's like I've, I've gone to a couple cool shows there, but people were sort of not tuned into that music. I think all the older heads moved away and there was a, there's a couple that come back but don't live there anymore. But I definitely don't know anything about this wild, crazy, like, I don't know if that was early 2000s or late 90s. 97. Yeah, it was okay. 97. The, uh, um, you know, you never know, man. Like, you roll into a town, you had some contact, and this is like pre internet. So, you know, like you were using Maximum Rock and Roll's Book Your Own Fucking Life, which was like literally a print magazine that had numbers of people who said that they could, you know, set up shows or whatever. Or you That's just awesome. Get, yeah, you would just get like contacts from your friends' bands or people and you would li literally call them or send them like letters, you know, and say, hey, you know, we're, we're passing through either of these two days. Can you set up a show or whatever? And you just don't know what it's going to be like, you know, you just kind of roll into town, you find a pay phone, again pre-cell phone so you find a pay phone you call the person hopefully they pick up you know <laughs> and hopefully hopefully the show's been booked you never know and uh so this this was at a skate park and we rolled up and you know it was kind of one of those things we're like hmm you know what what's this going to be like because it was it was a lot of young kids and they're all getting dropped off by their parents you know and they're all like skate rats with like triple xl like shirts you know and shit and we're like well, like okay this could be super cool or this could be like kind of a bummer so we didn't know we didn't know which way it was gonna go and they were just i mean they didn't know us you know so it wasn't that they came out to the show because of spaz they just came out because it, it was you know summer it was something to do their parents like were willing to you know drop them off and there, there's videos of it there, there's a vhs tape a comp I can't remember what it's called, but it's, but there's the portion of spaz is on, and it was, it was half for lack of a better term, like emo bands. And like, it was, I think like even like get up kids were in it and like all this. Oh, really? and spaz, yeah. Spaz was like, 
I think the only kind of like quote unquote like fast core, grind core, power violence band or whatever. And there's only one song in there, but you'll see in the video, like the kids just like were, you know, excited. And yeah, it was, yeah, it was one of, it was one of the best shows of tour. It was by far the most memorable. Like we, we talked about that when we got back, we were just like, dude, those kids were, were nuts, you know, like somehow we, we turned them, you know, like they didn't know who we were or whatever. And they just had a blast and they were all super stoked and wanting to talk after the show and stuff. And they were all, yeah, it was, you know, it was super cool. Hell and, yeah. I feel, sorry, you go. Oh yeah. I was just going to say, you know, with small towns like that, I mean, even with big towns, planets align for a summer, you know, like kids are out of high school before they go to college. They happen to be in hardcore or punk at that time. There's like a core of like 10 people who've organized the show, who've maybe like, you know, gotten some records out into the scene, got the word out, flyered for it. Uh, there's a bunch of kids who have nothing to do. And so they go to the show and you go there the next year, nothing, you know, like venues yeah. closed. Those kids went off to college. Yeah. You know, some, some kids are all, you know, on drugs or something and so, <laughs> you know, or whatever, you know what I mean? But it's just, it was yeah. just that one summer where it was just like, Perfect, Everything man. lined up. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, I hear awesome. you. Yeah. Max, I got a couple of greens or uh, Greenville questions for you, actually. <laughs> You're going to test my memory because well, all, all I remember is that is that that show. Well, here's what's crazy. I was also in Greenville in 97, but I was I was three years old. So it doesn't count. Kind of. You should have come um, out, man. <laughs> you should have come out. Three years old. Don't even know anything about anything, but I really liked uh, Intergalactic by the Beastie Boys. That was my favorite song when I was three. Yeah, um, yeah your, your parents raised you right, clearly. Yeah. Like yeah. My, mom, my mom has great taste. That's, uh, that's about it. It's funny. Her taste is basically like an old Lollapalooza lineup mixed with top 40s. It's awesome. Hey, that's fine. Um, yeah, Beastie dude, Boys, I'm, you know, even, even with all my you know g'd out friends out in the west coast you know still like beastie boys you know like everybody thinks oh beastie boys kind of a hipster you know or whatever but like you can't talk shit on beastie boys like yeah these dudes, you know they're like <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's i sick. saw uh recently um they had on youtube their their final show and it was when they were like playing bonnaroo 2009 i'd i'd never seen any beastie boys footage like that and i was like man these guys are cool yeah but um do you remember the name of the skate park that you played i i can i can find that out i can't remember off the top of my head but I, I can find that out it was an indoor and it was uh i mean i remember because we played the flat bottom of the quarter pipes and on one side the quarter pipes went up to a bowl i think we That's played cool. the same skate park then because um my band leech ate uh, it was backdoor skate park um could, could be actually that kind of actually the... rings a bell yeah, it, it almost it almost looks like okay. So to get in there, it's like the skate parks in a warehouse kind of looking thing. But first, you have to walk in the front door. It's like this little hallway of a skate shop, and then you go to the back room, you make a left, and then boom, uh, you got the whole skate park right there. Yeah. Um, while you were there, did did you happen to meet someone named Darius King? Does that name ring uh, a bell? I can't. I can't remember. I okay. you know I there was a scene. There was a scene and there was a band that they were super good to us and we stayed at their house and we just totally connected. And uh, for the life of me, I cannot remember the band or the people who had like treated us so well. I mean, there, there was this small yeah. scene of like, you know, 20 somethings, even though most of the crowd was like in their, in their teens or, you know, maybe right. even younger. I mean, they were like skate rats, but but there was a punk house, you know, and it was the punk house who had set up the show. I, I just can't remember um, who that was. Gotcha. I went on that weird tangent because, like I said, we played Greenville once and how we got invited up there was through our through our now friend, Darius King. They just hit us up saying, hey, do you want to play for Horse Rip or open for Horse Rip? I was like, who's that? They're like, oh, members of uh, Versal Man and Combat would have better. And I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, I want to I play that show. <laughs> awesome. I was it would, have, it would have been wild if it turned out like, hey, we both played Greenville because of the same one person. That would have yeah. been, speaking yeah. of making the world a little it, bit it could smaller. Be. It, it really could be, actually. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just can't remember the, the, the name of the people um, who, who helped us out and set up the show. And stuff. Right. I'll have but, to bug them about it later. 
yeah yeah but what's up to to that scene man that that was a great show and and they were super nice and so very grateful you know even though that was almost a quarter of a century ago i mean green greenville is is was good to us and then all the all the friends that we made there um you know they're still cool people and uh from what i've been seeing like they have a pretty active like old school screamo scrams whatever you want to call it kind of thing like hey all of our all of our bands really like you know page 99 orchid that kind of stuff cool cool um so it's cool to see that they still have some life kicking out there in, in greenville shouts out greenville yeah i bet i bet back at that time the hardy brothers were probably at least there if not involved in booking i don't know if you've met uh them they've come out to the bunker a lot i think I think uh, Chris Hardy is best friends with uh, Usman. Uh, nice. He runs Velted Negrub Distro. Shout out Velted Negrub. Really good cool. distro. Lots of like old like 80s bootleg stuff. Um, cool. Nice dudes. Yeah. Uh, I got a question for you, Max. Shoot, Eli. Um, all right. So with uh, with Spaz, um, and just like I guess this is kind of a two two part question. So with Spaz, I was gonna ask like, what were some of your guys's like original musical influences? Because you guys obviously sounded to me, you guys sounded completely different than anything else going on in the '90s. You know, yeah. I guess. Uh, I guess Infest came around a little before that. So there's yeah. that, but, uh, you know, and then you got early eighties bands like Deep Wound and Siege and stuff like that, which I can kind of see, but you guys are, you guys were a lot weirder than those bands yeah. as well, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, what were you guys drawing from, you think? Well, you know, we, we started, I was still doing Plutocracy, which was a grindcore band. Oh, and, you, <laughs> see, I don't even, Oh my God. I didn't know you were in Plutocracy. <laughs> I fucking love Plutocracy. Yeah. That, that was my first Fuck band. Yes. Yeah. So that was like my, my high so school you band. Drums in Plutocracy. Yeah. 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 Fuck, so, man. Yeah. And so we, you know, I was doing that. And when I first, again, like much of the stuff that we've already talked about, you know, the, they had a drummer, the, this band Plutocracy, they, they were like one or two years younger than me in high school you know in high school one year or two years younger is like a big thing nowadays like it doesn't mean yeah. anything you know when you're 47 or whatever um <laughs> you know if it's like but the uh so they said hey we need a drummer and i was like okay I, you know i can play drums and they they were kind of playing fast yeah like they're punk, really hardcore. Weird. Yeah. well yeah so so at the time <laughs> before before i joined they were playing kind of like early fyp dri kind of like fast just oh, like yeah. three chord you know kind of like punk or whatever and then i started turning them on to you know things like basically napalm death and oh, you know yeah. extreme noise terror just any all the stuff that was coming out of the uk at the time which was like you know 87 okay. 88 89 and so that's when we started making the transition to kind of like trying to go faster and play a little grindier and stuff and uh and so at the end of that you know, this was like maybe like 91, 92. And I had met Dan, who is the guitarist of Spaz. And he, he was doing a band called Sheep Squeeze. And we both connected because we were into, you know, bands like, you know, Infest and Crossed Out and everything that was kind of happening at that time. We, won't, we wanted to do a side project kind of like that. And so uh -huh. sure enough, uh, we started practicing in his garage trying to mimic kind of like power violence, like really brutal, you know, like crude kind of like song structure kind of stuff. Yeah. And, um, and did that. Hey, Dylan. Hey, how's it going? What's and, up, uh, Dylan? <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, I'm kind of late. Uh, kind of busy for a minute. No worries. So, it's okay, and, bud. <laughs> and, and so then, um, and then Chris heard about it and Chris wanted to join. And so Chris joined and learned the songs and then we recorded the first EP. But if you hear like maybe the first year of Spaz, like we we're trying to figure out what we're doing. And it wasn't until maybe like La Revancha, which is like the later, you know, it took us about three years to kind of find the style and that. And by that time we were just drawn on 
what we were into, you know, basically we we're into hip hop. So we were, you know, into yeah. like ultra magnetic MCs and cool Keith and all this stuff. So we're drawing yep. samples from cool Keith, you know, we're into like New York hardcore as well. So, you know, d- just basically trying to bring in. That's awesome. You know, okay. Like, Cause I fucking, I listened to La Revancha today and I, I, I was thinking I could hear the New York hardcore parts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if like, that was maybe supposed to be a little like tongue in cheek or if you guys were really into that, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I mean, no, you that's know, sick, dude. Yeah, cool. you know, I think back then, even though the distinctions were still, I mean, you know, pretty stark, I guess, but you know, it just feels like, you know, back then uh, there was less kind of genres to distinguish between and different categories that applied to different bands. And basically like, if it was like, you know, pretty heavy and fast, uh, you know, and, you know, at least with good politics, you know, uh, yeah. you know, then, then you're into it or at least we were. So, you know, that included yeah. everything from really minimal grindcore to, you know, FYP to early sick of it all to, you know, anything, yeah. basically any, anything that kind of fell within that, you know, but now, yeah, yeah those distinctions are so clear that people are like, Oh, I only listen to like Scandinavian right. hardcore DB, you know, but I don't <laughs> exactly. listen to, you know, but New York like, hardcore is out of the question. Yeah. It's or, like, or New yeah. York hardcore kids, you know, being like, Oh, I can't listen to that shit. You know, yeah, like, what it's if, too, it sounds you know, too raw or yeah, no, I, yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, and so, so we just, we just drew upon all that. And, and I think it was by the time La Rulancha came out that like, we finally had our own style, you know, where, Chris, who was from Sticky, I think, you know, you can hear a lot of Sticky in, and the humor in Spaz, and you can hear a lot of, like, <laughs> kind of the, the hip-hop, like, graffiti skate culture, you know, coming yeah. from, you know, Dan, and uh, and just, you know, yeah, it all kind of just gelled, but it took it took a couple of years to find out what we were, you know, figuring out what we are doing, so. Cool, man. That's what's yeah. up. Yeah, I always always loved the like the hip hop samples in in the in the music, you know. That always yeah. just added like this unique thing to it. And like it 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 all, you know, it always felt very west coast. And since I'm from the east coast, it was just like like listening to this stuff that's just like from this whole other fucking side of the world that just I've never seen, you know. It and it yeah. sounds dangerous and fucked up you know well that, like, that's that's how we listen to like S- sunday matinee hardcore stuff right. coming out of cbgb's you know in the late yeah. 80s where we were like holy shit like what's up with like outburst and breakdown <laughs> yeah. and you know and all this stuff we we're just like what the fuck are those shows like and what are these people like and you know like you had the records yeah. but you were just like oh man i bet it's super sketchy being in the lower yeah. side like going to these shows <laughs> or whatever you know? yeah so, yeah you know but oh yeah yeah, the, the world's a whole lot more connected and smaller, it seems now, you know, with these yeah. kinds of things, Zoom and, you know, I know, and everything like that. But back then, like, you, you would just, like, look at a magazine and be like, holy shit, what the fuck yeah. is going on out there, you know? Yeah, you? it's, like, a lot more mysterious. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, Dylan, I know you just jumped in. Uh, you got anything off the top of your head or um to throw at max or anything you want to talk about today in particular um nothing like super in particular um i was like checking out the like 65 discogs uh before i hopped on and just like taking a, a gander at a lot of that stuff and uh great just a great discography you know i love all the um all the like non-american bands on there that you give an exposure and stuff like that you know a lot of uh, Spanish stuff. I'm not sure if it's all like South American or any of it's from Europe and stuff like that. But um, I'm like, I'm glad to see like <clears throat> that representation because I feel like some labels don't really do that as much, you know? Yeah, and that that was actually, you know, 625 first started because no one was putting out my bands or my friend's bands, you know, uh, records. And so we, we had to do it ourselves. And so I, you know, first started on my, on the local scene and my bands and then I kind of expanded out to bands that weren't getting coverage that I thought were good either in the U.S. or you know Western Europe and then expanded that further to you know to basically international and particularly by the late 90s 
you know, connected with all these bands from like Brazil and Japan, Portugal and Spain and stuff like that. And just trying to get, you know, not only new bands at the time out, you know, just to kind of remind, you know, per- particularly what, you know, everybody calls kind of the thrash revival, I guess that's what, what the term is now, mm-hmm. like wh- what happens next and, uh, you know, yeah. tear it up and life's hall and all this stuff. You know, at that time, th- there there had been scenes, there had been bands doing that, you know, a couple of years before, like the North American bands, you know, and so basically the what 65 tried to do at that time was just to kind of remind everybody like, dude, this is like a larger thing, you know, going on, even though, of course, North American bands always get the exposure, you know, just, you know, for whatever reason, you know, but yeah. trying to trying to just show like, oh, you know, this is happening everywhere. And also earlier bands too, like, uh, you know, I mean, in English, HHH or uh, pardon my horrible pronunciation, but, you know, like fast core bands, you know, from Spain, like HHH, who were so instrumental and in kind of like, you know, playing that kind of music, you know, it's not power violence, you know, it's not thrash revival. It's like just great, really fast, hardcore, just trying to right. put out early stuff like that, just so people who, you know, aren't like super record nerds could hear it and like then think also like, oh, okay, this now explains why there was like a fast 90s power violence scene is because there was bands in the 80s, you mm-hmm. know, not just DRI and Cryptic Slaughter, but there was bands all over the world who were playing, you know, fast and right. stuff like that, so. Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, um, I was going to say, uh, or I was going to ask if you guys were influenced by the bands like Heresy and, you know, all those British bands, I, I definitely could hear that as well. You know? Yeah, I can, I can say without a doubt, Heresy is my favorite band of all time. Fuck you yeah, know? I love yeah. Heresy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and also, and what's interesting is they changed over time and still, I can say from their demo and the Never Healed Flexi all the way to the end, uh, you know, through face up to it and stuff. I, I loved everything that they did, even though their lyrics somewhat changed, you know, they were kind of like UK political at the beginning. They became like a little more kind of like posy, not youth crew, but you know, something like going on like yeah, more yeah. positive message later. But still, I mean, that <clears throat> fucking band, man, I, I absolutely yeah. love that band. And so that totally, you know, in, influenced us. And that And that's what I was listening to you know, that's how I got into all this stuff was just kind of trading tapes like in the mid 80s. And so when those bands started coming up in the mid to late 80s, you know, like Napalm Death was playing shows with Heresy. They were playing shows yep. with Doom. They were playing shows with Electro Hippies. It wasn't all, this is Grindcore. This yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Crust or whatever. And so you just right. get this tape and listen to it all. And it was all kind of fast and brutal. And you're just like, oh shit, these bands are so, you know, good. And now, you know, 30 years later it's all you know in their own genealogies or whatever but yeah yeah yeah, heresy heresy was you know like one of one of my favorites man for sure definitely that shit's sick yeah um can you uh what what were uh some of like what what was the first show that you remember playing with like plutocracy and and spaz well i remember the spaz show quite well but okay. I'm trying to think, what's the first, you know, so Plutocracy, we played a small pizza parlor in Redwood City <laughs> okay. called Pony Express Pizza that was run uh, by uh, an immigrant family, a Chinese family. And and uh, I don't think the pizza business was doing very well. So they would do live bands, like local rock bands, just to try and bring in people and have beer sal- sales or whatever. And um, there was no stage and they would just move picnic tables that were inside where you would eat pizza and they would just leave the benches and they would hire two security guards and they would tell everybody, you can't stand, you got to sit on these benches and watch the bands or whatever. (laughs) So, so the first plutocracy shows were at this place called the Pony Express Pizza and MDC played there, RKO oh, played there, like oh, all these wow. like Barry of thrash metal bands like had played there. That's, there there, there was awesome. like near riots, you know, because like people would start, you know, slam dancing and then the yeah. security would like be hitting with flashlights and they would have to call the cops. And, you know, the next day and like the local newspaper would be like near, near a riot yeah, know, downtown yeah, or right. something like that. But that, that was, those were our first shows. Uh, that's that's funny yeah so go pony express pizza and actually uh that's how 
uh, I learned of these guys, uh, Morbid Life Society, which is a 625 band, and they, they kind of influenced me. They were kind of like a Bay Area thrash metal, uh, you know, thrash crossover kind of band that influenced me. And I saw them there and I was blown away. Um, and then um, with Spaz, uh, because we knew, I, so Chris was friends with Ken Sanderson, who, who now does prank. I think at the time he wasn't doing prank, but Ken Sanderson was booking shows at Gilman Street. And, and I don't even think our first EP was out yet, but he booked us on a show that was uh, Chaos UK and Grimple. And oh, wow. Chaos UK, Grimple, I think Capitalist Casualties played. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, and all I remember is we set up and we played and there was no one there, but there was two totally drunk people who just stood in the front yelling Chaos UK the whole time that we played. And so we would stop <laughs> and you just hear these people being like, Chaos UK! You know, something like that. And it was just like totally demoralizing. We're like, mm, yeah. you know. <laughs> but, uh, that's, yeah. yeah. But you that's know, that's for funny. shows, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. I'm sure you had plenty more to make up for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it took, it took a while. It took a couple of years. I mean, we most definitely put in our time and we, we opened yeah. a lot of shows, you know, and a lot of people were not into us, you know? Uh, so, you know, it just, you, you know, I mean, that's just how it goes, right? You just keep on playing and s see where it goes. And, you know, luckily it worked out for us where, you know, people started understanding what we were doing, but at least at the beginning, right. you know, like people were just like, what the fuck is this shit? You yeah. know? Like, these guys suck, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could see that, especially for the 90s. I mean, I, the, the more popular stuff was super slow, you know? Yeah. Or, and just total um, pop. You know, like particularly yeah. at Gilman Street, because once Green Day broke, oh right, every, right, every A yeah. and R guy was down at nine two four Gilman Street looking for the next like Green Day or Sam I Am or whatever, you know. And then yeah, yeah. In in that in that context, power violence. Well, f first of all, those shows weren't even being booked, and those bands weren't being booked, and it was only with like Chris doing these annual festivals called Fiesta Grandes that you actually yeah, yeah. had those bands coming together. But before he did those shows, like those bands weren't being booked. Like Plutocracy was never booked. You know, we, we got booked towards the end of our career, uh, or career, whatever you call it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, you know, it, it was just of the time, it was the early nineties. So everything was just kind of like pop punk and melodic and, you know, stuff, so. Yeah. Well, everything sense. probably shifted that way after then, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, like those bands, you know, there was early bands from the late 80s doing it that got no love. And then, you know, they continued into their early 90s. Capitalist Casualties, I mean, you know, how they were playing, what, since like 86, 87, you know, and they, they came from the North Bay. So, you know, a, about an hour north of San Francisco and, and Berkeley, two hours, actually. Um, and they would get booked every now and then, you know, uh, but, you know, they didn't get much love during during that time just because of, you know, where the scene was and uh, where the popular bands what kind of you know bands there, there were at the time you know but by 96 97 you know things you know there was you know enough of a scene um particularly because there was a lot of people just kind of dedicated to it that kind of survived through that you know they were like putting out their own records setting up their own shows doing their own zines doing their own distros you know and like no one was buying this stuff at first but you know fast forward five years six years later there's actually like a pretty tight-knit you know good good scene by then but um but yeah at the beginning i mean people were i'm surprised like we didn't get shit thrown at us like when we were playing live and stuff you know <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it happens so yeah it happens um uh, so I read uh, I read on Discogs that six two five started in like ninety three. Is yeah, that about right? I think so. You know, I'm a, okay. I'm a little I'm a little fuzzy on the year. I actually, um, you know, I released two Plutocracy records uh, with uh, not under a name, uh, be, just because we had to get it out. We had to do it ourselves. Yeah, uh, and that was like ninety one maybe wow. I think, 91 and then by the time i 
we were talking about doing the no less ETO split. I think they didn't actually record. I mean, it's like 93, 94, somewhere around there. Yeah. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, so, uh, so you'd say about around 96, 97 is when the, the power violence scene was kind of like the most put together or, or, yeah. or like it was going the best you would say, I guess. I mean, I, I guess I, you know, I don't, maybe I don't have enough to kind of compare it to like what came afterwards, uh, yeah. you know, particularly with like, you know, later waves of it. But at that time, yeah, about 97. And we learned about that, you know, when Spaz went on tour, you know, we were happy to be able to book a tour. And then we went out on tour. And once we got to the East Coast, we started, you know, playing like, 200 person shows 300 person shows and we're like holy shit like we didn't even know 200 people even knew of us you know let alone in the same city and yeah. and that that's when it we, we you know found out like that you know people knew of us and were buying our records and stuff but before we were kind of clueless on that i mean we knew everybody like worshipped infest and crossed out and stuff as we did you know but uh, it wasn't yeah. until about 97 or so that we at least for us, for Spaz, like we started figuring out like, oh shit, like people actually like, like this like joke band that we're doing. <laughs> you know? so. so, uh, so, so Crossed Out was around before Spaz then? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you guys didn't really like play shows together or anything or? We... I'm, I'm trying to figure out when all these sort of the, what people consider the first wave, you know, I'm trying to figure out the timeline, I guess, you know? I mean, it's tough you know and everybody you know has their own opinions and yeah whatnot. i know yeah. athena and melissa who are doing a documentary on power violence the power violence project they, they, they have a, actually a pretty good timeline and they, and when they interviewed me for it they actually were um they were uh kind of schooling me they're like oh it happened in this year and it was this and i was like oh okay like <laughs> good to know first time i've heard it but yeah. the way that i understood it was like you know, there was bands like No Comment and Infest. I was going to ask about No Comment as well, yeah. You, you know, and that was like late 80s. And, okay. you, know, uh, you know, their demos were reviewed in Maximum Rock and Roll. So we, you know, ordered their demos and started tape trading with them. And it wasn't until later that, that then Crossed Out, who saw themselves as kind of like, you know, playing like Infest and, you know, maybe Impact Unit or something, but it was really Infest that they, you know, were kind yeah. of trying to distill just like the the most basic bare bones of what Infest was doing. At the same time that Pissed Happy Children had already broken up and then Charred Remains and Man is the Bastard were happening at the same time that crossed out. So that's like almost kind of like maybe second wave if you want to call oh. Infest or no comment, you know. And then third wave would be like lack of interest and, you know, other things. And probably spaz would be okay. Later, yeah. Even for, fourth wave or something, you know, if we're thinking okay. about just by year by year. Right. Right. Okay. That's what's up. I was, I was just curious about that. Um, yeah. Hold on. Yeah. It's just, it's so weird that, you know, nowadays, I mean, just think like you watch a band put out records over a span of years. And then like maybe by the seventh or eighth year of them being around, they start changing their style. And you're like, oh, they're changing their style. You know, like, uh, you know, but you had seven or eight years of them like putting out pretty substantial good releases of the same style. Yeah. But, but I felt like in the eighties, like bands started sucking earlier, you know, like band, like bands put out a really good record and within a, like a year or two, they would start selling out or starting like, you know, playing metal or like rock or something like that oh, and like even you know but then rock switch yeah you yeah, know like yeah. all the boston bands or like SSD. You know, yeah ssd yeah. dys <laughs> yeah you know and but like I, I and i also think like if you think of like what happened between 87 and 93 there was all these like condensed developments you know that explain you know the origin of grindcore and power violence and even you know death metal basically you know a, a kind of death metal after Bathory or Venom you know or whatever and um it was all just like this like kind of five years where you know every six months there was something new happening or some new band formed and 
you know, from that 30 years later, there's a whole new tree in the genealogy that goes in some kind of direction or whatever, you know? Yeah. It's hard to, hard to keep track. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you go, Will. I, I feel like I'm hogging everything. Someone else talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, at this point, it's like, uh, my question is like now five questions together. So you'll have to, you have to piece this apart. Um, so it, it's more around like sort of the mythology of Spaz and how y'all had all these things that I think would be pretty weird happen. So uh, I'll fast forward back to my personal music uh, history. Um, when I was a kid, I loved short music for short people. And then like, like 15 years later, I'm like, oh man, I was listening to Spaz when I was like 14 or 15. And yeah, I had no dude. idea. Like, uh, honestly, the Spaz song next to a bunch of poppy stuff, like, like you, you go from like bouncy poppy songs to like the Spaz song and it sort of leaves your palate a little funky. Like, no offense to you. Like it's, if you hear Spaz front to back, you're like, yeah, sure. so First. I'm sure there's a whole generation of pop punk kids <laughs> who also had that same they had that same uh, reaction where they're like, "What the hell is this crap?" Yeah, I'm I'm looking at uh, this this the tracks for this comp. I didn't know what this was, but this is pretty funny. Yeah, I could see this. <laughs> I could see Spaz being a shock to the system. It's a know? great album. Like, even, I mean, Spaz is great being on there. There's. Uh, I'm not a huge Blink-182 Blink uh, fan, but uh, they just have a song with cuss words sung front <laughs> to back. Um, like this definitely sort of propulsed me through like, oh, like a bunch of this stuff is sort of dumb, but you pick out the stuff that you're like, well, like maybe I should check out Descendants a little more. Maybe I should check a veil out a little bit more. Poison Idea. I mean, I was hearing Poison Idea at that age. Like, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Misfits. Yeah, and, and you know how that came out? That, that That's a Fat Records release, right? Yep. That comp? Yeah. yeah Chris, Chris Dodge was label manager for Fat Records. Oh, I didn't and even actually, know that. Yeah, and so he, you know, he, uh, I'm trying to think of the trajectory. He was all, he was label manager for Alternative Tentacles and then he went to Fat Records. And actually, uh, uh, Fat Records, when they were the most active, there was a lot of punks uh, working there, you know, either doing kind of mail order stocking or doing sales or whatever. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people who might not be into kind of the regular fare of um, Fat Records, but, you know, Fat Mike uh, employed a lot of people, you know, and treated them, you know, uh, quite well, at least I think from what I remember, at least from the time, you know, there was people who, you know, uh, we're getting health insurance and getting oh, wow. an okay, you know, paycheck, you know, through, through fat records or whatever. But yeah, Chris was label manager. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, somehow, you know, it was just like, Oh yeah, we gotta, we gotta get spaz on this or something, you know, and talk somebody into it. And I think fat Mike probably was probably into it. You know, I don't know. I don't know the real, what the conversation was but that's probably how that happened i heard i heard some folklore that uh fat mike took the idea of uh blorg and blew it up into that which i mean it to me it worked better to, than blurg because i never had blurg in my hands but i had that for like six dollars at a best buy when i was like 13 or 14 like cracking open new connections like yeah. you find you find green day in the 90s and then you you find like offspring, but then you find minor thread and then it's all downhill from there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I hear you. I mean, uh, yeah, I think we, we were on like a AK press comp that, that was in support of the press at, at the time. And, you know, with a lot with some pretty established bands at the time, uh, we're on that fat records comp. We're on uh, the gummo soundtrack, you yeah, know? That, that, uh, that's oh, another thing shit. I had on cue. Yeah, we're, we're, that's, that's yeah, pretty we're, cool. 
Yeah, it was, and it was all just black metal bands. And then who the fuck and, shows and, up in the middle is Spaz. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't even make any sense. Yeah, so. and Sleep is on it. I want to oh, say yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's slow motion with the bicycles with the kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So how like, did we, Spaz we, get on Gummo soundtrack? Somebody just uh, somebody just wrote us, uh, and it was, it was so the woman. Cool. Yeah, it was the woman who was working for the production company and and if i remember correctly i think she was affiliated with the cbgb's scene and so kind of like mid 90s you know into like you know metal crossover thrash black metal and stuff like that and somehow uh, just reached out to us and and so we didn't know what that was going to entail and they said they said um you know we'll give you I can't remember how much it was like five grand for a song. And we're like, what five grand for a spaz song, you know, like we, we write 15 songs to practice, you know? And so, so we, so we actually tried to put some time into it. We're like, okay, we, we, we gotta, we can't just barf out, you know, some like 15 second song or something. So, so we tried, so we tried to make a okay song sure, and send it to them. And sure enough, they, you know, they, they paid us and we used that money to get a uh, van for the 97 tour. And so it was basically because of the Gummo soundtrack that that we had uh, some kind of financial uh, security that allowed us to go on tour uh, that pro- we probably wouldn't have been able to do that tour without without the the Gummo soundtrack. But we, yeah, we're, I, you know, at the time I was like, is this selling out? Am I selling out right now? You know, they're like, we'll pay you four grand. I'm like, what do I sign? You know, like, we gotta, yeah. you know? Dude, I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, it, that's and, so cool. Yeah, and they they it was they treated us right. Um, they didn't screw over any of the bands. You know, the film industry stuff is very different from sketchy music industry stuff. And I'm sure you know there's sketchy film industry stuff, but the the people treated the bands, I think, right. I don't I don't think any of the bands had any of the issues. And somehow, weirdly, Spaz was on there. I don't even, you know, just there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense with spaz, and that's just like one more thing where you're just like, well, I mean, this was on the Gummo soundtrack, you know? I, you know, in a way, it doesn't make sense, but if you actually watch the movie, it kind of makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised they had a budget for that movie for music. Oh well, after after the success of Kids. You know, oh, when kid, yeah. kid, Kids was like... I thought Gummo was first in my head, so I didn't realize yeah, no, that. Gun, yeah, and so I think, you know, once once it came out that he was the writer of Kids, you know, it was just like there was production companies throwing money at him, you know? And <laughs> and the, the nice thing was he was throwing it directly to these, like, underground black metal and hardcore, yeah, dude. you know, sludge bands yeah. and stuff like that. So th- that, that was really cool. Yeah. Um, to continue on with weird stuff, uh, <laughs> I know this is all on the internet. It's been talked about plenty of times, but uh, getting back to my own musical timeline, uh, I discovered uh, Dr. Octagon very early, uh, which A introduced me to uh, Pusshead artwork, which I still love. Uh, mm-hmm. And I until I read some interviews, I had no idea when he talks about spaz in there, like he just has a quick one word shout out. Yep. Uh, I didn't realize till later that he is legitimately talking about y'all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think I've read the story, but if you'll uh, refresh me from your memory, what sure. happened there? Sure, and the, and a huge thanks goes out to Dan uh lactose who has a much better memory of all this stuff and <laughs> and had recently just told this story so listening to him i think i have probably some of the some of the parts right on this so we were all like in high school and afterwards we were huge ultra magnetic mcs fans so like the four horsemen album is like to me the holy grail of like hip-hop uh and so, so, you know, we had been following the stories of Cool Keith and then he went, you know, solo and some, some, he was on the West Coast and he was doing this project with the Automator. Um, and the Automator actually lived in the same house with one of our close friends, this guy, Neil Nordstrom, who, who basically was this huge record collector 
and he came to Epicenter uh, every weekend. Epicenter was a, a volunteer DIY run punk store in San Francisco that Timmy O'Hannon started. So oh, it was cool. like a maximum rock and roll started all volunteer store. And uh, Dan and I worked there on Sundays and it kind of turned into kind of like hardcore power violence grindcore day uh, mixed in with some hip hop. And so uh, on Sundays it would be like Timogen and Walter Glazier and uh, you know, Don Kim and Neil Nordstrom and all these people that would come in and we would just be playing kind of like this kind of music. But Neil Nordstrom lived at the house with the automator who went on to do, um, what, what's the band, what's the hip hop Eltron. group? Three thirty thirty. Yeah, it's it's the it's the it's the hip hop group where it's uh, anime characters. Gorillas. Gorillas. Oh, so so yeah. yeah. So he so he's done gorillas. You know, like he's he's like of that level. He's like you know, but yeah. at the time he was doing the side project with Cool Keith and and Neil Nordstrom knew we liked Ultra Magnetic MCs and he called me and he was like, Yo, dude, uh, Cool Keith's at my house right now and I was like, Holy shit! And I couldn't go there, but I called Dan. I was like, Yo, Dan uh cool keys up at neil's house and and dan was like i'm free i'll go up there i'm gonna bring like a cassette recorder and try and get him to drop something on a cassette and, re and give him a bunch of spaz stuff so he went up there and you know all the cool keys stories are true you know he was kind of like acting all weird and like talking to dan about all the different porno movies that he had just bought and stuff you know and dan's like well this is kind of freaking me out you know but like <laughs> you know but dan was like yo can you you know i'm in this band called spaz and um and he was and cool keeps was like is that kind of like grindcore you know and like dan was like yeah and he's like oh yeah i'm Whoa. into like i'm into this band and i'm into that band and like he knew of these bands he knew of autopsy you know and dan was like yeah, I mean, we're kind of like the. Punk you said he knew of that. autopsy. He knew of autopsy. So, That's so in sick. yeah, so in the Doctor Octagon album, he says, "Oh, what's the line?" He says, "Waiting in line for Def Leppard, Autopsy, and Spaz, and all that jazz." But so, so we get dropped with Def Leppard and Autopsy. In, in a That's... Way. Yeah. what a lineup i know what a lineup. yeah really dude. and and that's because dan went up there to see him and, and he was stoked on the spaz stuff that that dan gave him and at the time he also dropped like a little shout out on this tape recorder that then dan took uh, and put a beat to and and we put that shout out kind of like what we were thinking is like krs1 on the sick of it all album and we're like yeah. okay, this is this is gonna be cool keith on the spaz la revancha album you know um, yeah yep. yeah, it's, yeah so people always ask us they're like uh you know this is before cameo and all that kind of stuff they're like uh how did you get cool keith to you know drop yeah. on your album you know and then and then later uh neil was like yo dude he mentioned you in a in a lyric and we're like <laughs> yeah yeah but, you know, that, that album like, is amazing yeah that's yeah and it blew up it blew up like that album was just like it's probably bigger than ultramagnetic mcs and all that stuff great album well that's so cool man eli and i cheated and we we got a cameo for project pat for our album yeah. but i don't i don't regret that I, I love that oh i don't i don't regret it but i i'm i uh to be honest, I was just kind of expecting like maybe you guys wrote Cool Keith or some shit and like offered him some money or I don't fucking know. But that's yeah, no, a way I mean, cooler we, story. Yeah, we could have. I mean, we would have written him if we knew where to write, you know. Yeah, um, no, I feel you. Yeah, like, I, <laughs> yeah, I got, um, you know, I think I still have my Ultra Magnetic MCs. I have a poster I gave, I gave Dan because I couldn't go. I think I was working or something, but I was like, Dan, if you go, you know, please have him sign something. And I had a ultra magnetic four horsemen's poster and he signed that and stuff like that. And like to still oh, to yeah. this day, I'm like, you know, praying to it every morning, you know. Well, uh, I, love, is... I love how he's like, Oh, is this grind core? Yeah. <laughs> this is that grind core <laughs> shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's when Dan was like, huh? Like, you know, grind. So that, that, that's when they started rapping. L luckily that's when the conversation shifted from like hardcore pornography to, you know. To, like, yeah. <laughs> hardcore punk. Yeah, to hardcore Tomato, tomato. Punk. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm not trying to talk crap on him, but when I saw him play Local 506, it was, I, I know he reconnected with Dan the Automator and went on a big tour after this, but his recent smaller comeback before his big comeback 
he he rolled up with I'm pretty sure a backing CD, uh, <laughs> like a just like a black plastic bag of stuff that you, I wasn't sure what it was and uh, just sort of did his thing and uh, <laughs> it it wasn't a big production but I, I had fun like I I came to hear the Doctor Octagon stuff and he played some and. Uh, it was a bizarre, tiny, weird uh, concert of sorts, but <laughs> it's yeah, very strange. I mean, the, the, and and, and five oh six is like kind of that'd be awkward for a small rap show. You know what I mean? That's yeah. yeah why maybe? <laughs> yeah, the uh, you know he he he's had problems. You know, uh, and there, there, now I think it's well known that you know he's struggled with some stuff. Um, and even during ultramagnetic MCs in their interviews, they would say like, we couldn't record because he, he's institutionalized, you know, and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for us, that was kind of like the veneer of like, ooh, you know, like this guy's like literally crazy, you know, or something yeah. like that, you know, but like the older you get and the more people you meet, you actually, you know, you really start understanding, damn, like people got, you know, substance abuse and, you know, you know, mental health issues and stuff. And, and, you know, the sad thing is, is like they were they were kind of I mean, maybe it's not even sad. Maybe it's actually kind of um, kind of cool. in, in a way, you know, Dr. Octagon was going to blow up like in, in a way that it was going to be like Lollapalooza and like, you know, th this kind of stuff. And there, from what I understand, there, there was times where Dan the Automator was up on stage like at a Beck show and cool Keith was nowhere to be found, you know? And so like, they had to break contracts and they like lost all this money and, you know, they, they were going to be this big thing, but I, you know, cool Keith, I think like, I don't know what happened with all that stuff, but you know, I mean, I think just his personal troubles got in the way may, and maybe kept it kind of like underground and DIY. So it's not like Dr. Octagon is now affiliated with some Lala bigger Palooza, you know or something right you know? some 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 more mainstream like a more mainstream type of audience keeps yeah. it yeah i get what you're saying um i didn't know all that about cool keith though uh that's definitely interesting i'll have to read up on him yeah you, you know i mean even from early on i mean from the ultra magnetic mc's days they were reporting some stuff and then after but once he actually got really successful with the dr octagon and just the cool keith projects after that you know, more and more people, you know, were finding out, you know, that, you know, I mean, he had his issues or whatever. Yeah, he, you yeah. know, and like who, you know, who, who doesn't? And also, like, we, we all have friends, you know, that are struggling with stuff. And just imagine trying to be, you know, in the limelight the whole time and like trying to, you know, do all yeah. this stuff. And so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, I think, I think I would probably have a bit of a, a freak out as well if I was about to be on that level, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's that's awesome that you got to get that shout out, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. super cool. Yeah. Uh, again, I never uh, equated like that was the time before I knew Spaz. So I just was like, that's weird. He says Spaz in here, but he just says a bunch of weird things. So, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Gummo, Fat Records and Cool Keith. <laughs> check, check, check. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the other things I, I had as far as mythology was I feel like the the Jeb EP was like a mysterious album that no one had. And then the 25 to Life split never had an official release, but then some legitimate ones popped up on eBay and I snagged one back in the day when I was uh, a collector and was really excited to get a real copy of that. Um, yep. Uh, was there any reason that those were limited or not officially released? Yeah, well, the um, the twenty five to life split was uh, the idea of John from very distro in Edison. Um, rest in peace, because uh, he I, I learned that he passed away. Oh, I didn't know um, he passed away. That's yeah, he, yeah, he passed away recently. I didn't know that. Um, but at the time, he you know he was running a distro. Uh, we would rap on the phone about stuff. He was teaching me a ton about like East Coast, like underground wrestling because he was super into that. And uh, and we would talk, you know, and here's again, you know, one of those kinds of things like where 
you know, we would talk about like New York hardcore or like metal core or whatever you call it in the nineties. And, you know, I would talk about the bands that I like, which what were the bands that like very, or like Edison was putting out of that kind of like larger level, you know, converge and these kinds of bands. Right. And, um, and, uh, and I think we just started talking about 25 to life, you know, and I was like, dude, I like them, you know, like, I'm, I'm not gonna lie I, I i like 25 to life and like and, and i've i've gone and seen 25 to life a ton i've gone to seeing come and correct a ton I, I've Dude, written, that, that, that makes me very happy to hear uh, you know, i don't really like 25 <laughs> to life i just i just like that you like all this stuff well you know now i you know i i've learned that it's gotten a little more complicated as of recently about you know certain politics about certain members you know saying right, right. On, you know so i i don't know about any of that but yeah you know, back, back, back in in the 90s you know here was a guy um who was trying to support young bands that weren't of the level of you know, the large New York hardcore bands, but they were like the smaller, like New Jersey or Pennsylvania, like young kids, but playing that style of music. So, you know, he was putting out, you know, I mean, a lot of people kind of talk crap on like, you know, maybe the quality of the EP covers or the demo yeah, tapes that yeah. he was, you know, he's putting out. And I can understand that, but, you know, he truly was kind of like the DIY version of that scene, you know, and, yeah. and his message, whether it was authentic or enough, is something I can get behind. Unity. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, like, I mean, it was, you know, every, every Friendship, like, loyalty. Yeah. Commitment. Commitment, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's like, you know, I mean, that's like a tattoo waiting to happen, you know? I mean, it was just like, so, um, so I think a lot of people thought like it was kind of like a joke or something like when we did it, but like, you know, I mean, on the label, you know, there's a picture of me and him. I, w I was at a 25 to life show and I was like, Rick, like, can we take a picture together? So we got a picture together and, he, yeah. um, here is some trivia. This is probably the first time uh, that, that it's been spoken about publicly. Long, long time ago, when Plutocracy was still playing and we were, right, we were just about, I think, to break up and we, we were doing, you know, our last show I think was um, the Fiesta Grande, the first Fiesta Grande with Asuk. And oh, um, sick. before that, we set up a show at like one of these pay to play clubs in our area that all the death metal bands played. And somehow we had talked to this, this club saying, yo, can we set up a show that's not pay to play, that's all ages and we'll do it on a Sunday afternoon. So, you know, no loss to you, you know, you can keep your Thursday through Saturday and, you know, make all your money and we're just gonna do this small thing. And it was a mortal fate Mind rot, phobia, plutocracy, colostomy, I think, and maybe exhumed, I think. I think exhumed opened the show. I can't remember. Oh, wow. And phobia and mind rot from Southern California came up uh, and stayed at my house. And mind you, like, this is when I was like still like 18 or something. So, like, you know, I'm kind of like a young, naive, you know, kid, like at the, like living with his parents or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, okay. you know, we got floor space. You can all stay here. Well, they came up thick. I mean, there was like literally 30 people that they came up with. Like, oh, like, one of which was Rick to life. <laughs> so, so then there's this guy who's, you know, with dreads and tattoos all over. And I'm just like, who is this dude? You know, I was like, is this guy from LA? You know, and he's talking about like New York hardcore and biohazard and all this stuff. I'm like, who is this guy? You know, or, and, you know, and later I was just like, man, that, you know, that, that was weird. That, that guy just kind of like crashed at my house and like kind of rode with the phobia of mind rot dudes. And then later I'm like, holy shit, that's Rick to life. You know, like when, when they started playing, I was like, oh shit, Rick to life today to my house, man, when that's I was like 18, so cool. <laughs> you know? Uh, and again, that's... it shows, it shows you how the scene, you know, like phobia and mind rot, which are kind of like considered like grind core, crust core. He was yeah. into that. You know, he was staying with them. So he came up, you know, with them and came to this death metal uh, grindcore show, you know, that we put on and stuff. So, you know, again, the, the scenes weren't so distinct, I guess, like maybe like right. at that time. That's awesome, man. That's hilarious. Yeah, I definitely I definitely thought the the split was a joke. Um, but uh, I think most people I think most people think that honestly i i don't know man it, it makes me happier to know that you actually fucked with them you know i yeah. can respect anybody that will openly admit 
hey, I fuck with 25 to life. I, I have <laughs> continually, with the side projects that I've done, I have continually tried to get people to do a cover of Hardcore Rules because that's a great song. It's a great song. It's the same yeah. riff, played fast, played mid-tempo, played breakdown, back to fast. I mean, it's just like the perfect. That's perfect. You know, it's, yeah, it's like a mad ball, ball of destruction era song. You know, right. it's like that. It's perfect. It distills everything great about hardcore, like down, you know, and he's singing about how much hardcore rules, you know, he's like hardcore rules, hardcore yeah. rules, you know, and I'm like, this is, this is the best thing ever. And yeah. I, for the life of me, you know, all my, all, everybody that I've played with, you know, they were just like, no, nah, we're not going to do this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, Dude, let's, let's do a cover of this, man. You know, so man, man, that's too bad. It, well, too so bad. so here's the call out to everybody. You know, if 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 we start a band together, <laughs> the, my my one my my the line is drawn. We got to do a cover of Twenty Five to Life's Hardcore Rules. <laughs> Fuck yeah, it's a good, <laughs> good song, good bass line to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the only thing that I'll that 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 will. That's my only terms for doing a side. There project. you go. Oh uh, man. Um, I'll agree to do a band that only does one song and it's that cover. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All of us are there in a band go. now. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can do a Judd Judd style right here over the Zoom. Yeah. I mean, I think I've got a, a pen I can uh, click and clack. Like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. Oh, and you guys also know, you know who was left Judd, right? B well, from B from Scholastic Death and yep. and uh, and all that no static and and all that stuff. So for that drummer, he it was Steve Heritage from Assac, I think was right Judd, and B was was left Judd. I might I might be getting the the stereo phonics there incorrect, but that's funny. Yeah, there's another small world connection. Yeah. So uh, I got a question about uh, the possessed to skate comp. Um, Cause that was, uh, I don't know. I just remember downloading that comp cause I, I really like despise you when I was, I was first getting into despise you. Right. And I, I think it was, it was some blogs, blog site, blog spot or whatever, where they would, they would, uh, you know, have a band and have like their full discography. So the possessed to skate comp was under despise you or whatever. Um, cool. and I saw on Discogs that 625 had put it out. Um, can you talk about how that came together a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think just at the time, uh, there was all these bands that skated and, you know, in the nineties, people kind of equated either pop punk or like post punk, or even just kind of like hip hop, like with skating, like that was the music okay. and the skate videos that were coming out at the time. But there was, you know, all these fast core bands that, you know, were playing that stuff. And, you know, uh, I mean, I guess the cat's out of the bag now, but Chris Elder, you know, before you couldn't say Chris Elder was in Despise You. But, now, you know, Chris is an old like pool skater from Despise You, you know, so yeah, we, yeah. Would, we would talk on the phone and he would talk about like Dogtown, you know, kind of stuff. And 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 uh, and then the Charles Bronson guys, they all skated, you know? And so like oh, when we would cool. visit, like we'd take each other to skate spots and stuff. And so, you know, we, I think I we were just thinking like, well, all these bands skate, you know, and they play kind of like this fast uh, kind of music, but it's never equated, you know, the two. So why don't we put out a comp, you know, as a, you know, homage to, of course, suicidal tendencies and like the old Venice, you know, welcome to Venice kind of stuff, but like, um, you know, basically with like really brutal bands, like not just, uh, you know, post punk indie bands or something, you know? Uh, right. Yeah. And so, yeah, we did two comps of two generations, you know, the first one. Yeah. Had, had the kind of the mid nineties kind of bands. And then we did a later 10 inch that had kind of like later of kind of, yeah, you know, more thrash kind of, you know, bands or whatever, but yeah, it was, it was just to kind of remind people like, you know, there's, of course, in the 80s, there was a close association with punk and skateboarding because, you know, both got beat up by the cool people at high school, both got harassed by cops. But, you know, I mean, it was the same thing. So yeah. it was only natural that, you know, you'd listen to like metal and punk and you'd skateboard because it was kind of like this anti, 
social anti-system thing to do or whatever you know and that kind of got lost in the 90s or whatever but i think yeah sorry uh okay i can still hear you um you know i was gonna say in the 90s it seemed like it sort of it all the image kind of got cleaned up a little bit maybe with skateboarding yeah yeah Yeah, exactly And, and it was just it was kind of like the new i think it was like the newest iteration of just trying to remind people because all the punks that we hung out with um you know, at least like in kind of the San Francisco scene that only a few of them skated, you know, so we were trying to bring like s- skate to them, but also right. reminding skaters like, you know, 10 years ago, we would all been listening to like COC animosity, you know, we wouldn't have been <laughs> yeah. listening to, you know, some snowboard pop punk core yeah, you know, yeah. or something like that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, yeah and to this day i still like a lot of people actually still hit me up about about that comp uh it seemed like a lot of people like picked it up and uh yeah you know appreciated it so that that's cool to hear yeah yeah it's definitely one of my favorite comps you know i don't know it's just one of the i just it was one of the ones that i found when i was young and it's always stuck with me you know um i know the first one a bit better than the second but i was looking at the second one today and it looked I saw Scholastic Death was on it. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, uh, there's that band Palatka that's yeah. on uh, the, the first one. Yeah. Where, were they from the West Coast or were they from Florida? Florida, Florida, Florida yeah. Uh, okay. H- how'd you find out about them? Saw them, actually. They, they came through on a tour with End of the Century Party. Again, the all roads lead back to B. Uh, B B is kind of the uniting factor of all this. B was the drummer of End of the Century Party before he moved out to the Bay Area. But um, okay, P- Palatka, they played, you know, and at the time, you know, there there was different, uh, what do you call subgenres within emo? What what I mean, you know, it's such a, such a weird appellation to begin with. But you know, within emo, there was really melodic emo, and there was really right. frantic emo that some people started calling screamo and stuff. Right. And P- Palatka, dude, they were crazy. They would set up, and their and their amps were on, and their they you know they would be open. Their instruments would be open, and they would start kind of tinkering around, and then they'd start playing and getting all ag- aggressive, and then they would just turn everything off after five minutes, and that was it. That was their whole set. Like their whole set was like you didn't know where their set started. You knew when it ended because you were just like pe- people were still like milling around. They didn't know if the band was you know like like sound checking or yeah (laughs) yeah but it was just like these like super short blasts of energy you know just like symbols falling over and just shit you know going crazy and and so when i saw that i was like dude that's basically power violence you know that's basically the energy of it you know in in a in a different key maybe yeah yeah. and you know talking to them and they skated you know and so we're just like oh yeah let's you know let's do this and i i know that you know compared to like maybe despise you you know, and Charles Bronson or something, maybe Palaka sits, you know, a little outside of that. But, you know, at the time it was just, um, you know, they're the just ferocity. another fast band. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, um, I always, I don't know their, their stuff, obviously, you know, it stands out a tiny bit from the other stuff, but yeah, I always really liked their stuff on that, uh, that comp. And I've, I don't think I've ever been able to find any other stuff by them online, which is unfortunate, but, uh, yeah, I always thought it was cool that you guys included them as well, since they're, you know, a, I guess people now would probably consider them scrams or screamo or whatever. But yeah. Yeah. And, Good you man. know, we we're, we're, we were communicating with that scene. So, you know, like whether it was Ice Nine or Palatka, Reversal of Man, End of the Century Party, you know, these these kinds of, you know, bands. So we were, we, we would play together and and trade and stuff like that you know back then because i think probably they also even within the emo scene they were probably estranged from it just because they were playing something that was you know it wasn't moss icon you know so it was yeah yeah. it sounded very very different you know um so they were probably closer to kind of what we were doing yeah i i would i would say so you know yeah i saw cj's eyes light up when he brought up screamo so i guess i'll talk about the only screamo release I can think of on six two five, which is Davola. Does that does that qualify as screamo? I, I, it sounds like screamo to me. Yeah. 
I mean, that yeah. dude's vocals are like oh, just oh. falsetto. <laughs> and they're so good. The whole reason I asked him to do the record is because of the vocals. You know. <laughs> CJ, are you familiar with Devola? Nah, but it sounds like I have more homework to do. Yeah, it's it's like Jerome's dream that no one heard about. Ooh. Yeah, it. Ooh. So the, how I knew about Devola was they, there you know there was a great uh, label called Mountain Records that was putting out all this kind of like upstate New York and um, like New Jersey uh, bands, and they put out a CD of Devola, and it got sent into um, Maximum Rock and Roll. And the person, I can't remember who reviewed it, hated it specifically because of the vocals. And I was like, I was like, oh man, I got to hear this if it got this kind of review. And so I listened to it and like, just think of like the snottiest, like Mark McCoy, like Charles Bronson vocals, but like to the hundredth degree, you know, I mean, it is just, it sounds like a five-year-old having a tantrum, like in your ear, you know? And I was like, man, that is so cool. That like, it's super <laughs> annoying. It's hard to listen to, you know? And I was like, oh, this is great. And so, uh, you know, I reached out uh, to them and, and, uh, and yeah, and saw them. They actually came out to California and played one time and um, yeah, just, you know, good, good people. But it was also one of those things, again, it was, you know, I felt weird that MR gave them a bad review and they were pretty fast and frantic and they were also doing something new and super annoying, you know, and I was like, oh shit, okay, I'm into it, you know, because that's, that's what everybody was saying, you know, about, you know, the, the bands that I was doing or whatever. I was like, oh man, this is like unlistenable and this is fucking, you know, annoying or whatever. And I was like, so yeah, Devola, man. I randomly became AOL and some messenger friends with Matt Grand. And this is after he, after Devola was a band, and I think he was doing like a band called The Exilar or something like that. Se seemed like a nice guy. I lost touch with him, but early two thousands, I, I was internet friends with that one guy from Devola. Cool. Yeah, which I know. That was oh, a yeah. great name uh, taken from Seinfeld. Yeah. They, oh, really? Yeah. Wait, what? Crazy That's Joe good. Devola. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. I didn't, I, I thought maybe, I don't know, Devola, it sounds like a, the name of a flower or some shit. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> um, speaking of band names, uh, there was a West Coast band called Max Ward, and I was wondering if you <laughs> like the band Max Ward. Uh, well, do I like the band? I, I mean, <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, I, I, uh, people, people told me at the time, you know, there's a band named after you. And I, and I, you know, I thought that was pretty, pretty wild. And I, I the, the way that I appreciate it is I hope they're taking the piss out of me, you know, that they're making like kind of fun of me and their covers and their t-shirt graphics and stuff were really funny. They had like, you know, they had a funny picture of like, <clears throat> I think, you know, somebody had come over to the merch table and like took a picture of me at Gilman or something. And I happened to have all the change in my hand. So I tried to like fan it out and be like, you know, like have some kind of like fan of money or whatever. And they, had, <laughs> they had Photoshopped it. So it's like this like huge fan of, you know, fake money that I have in my hand. And, and they took, you know, my graduation photo and made a shirt out of it and stuff. And I thought like, you know, that's, that's cool. <laughs> that's <know>? awesome. <laughs> yeah. But what was funny was once, once I was in grad school, you know, and I'm working with these, you know, these professors who are quite like scholars established in my field, uh, you know, and like I hold them in high esteem and they're like, you used to be in bands, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, and they're like, oh, you should bring over some CDs and we'll listen to it. I'm like, no, 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 you're not, you're not going to like any of this. Trust me. You think maybe it's like offspring, but trust me, it's not, not even, you know, you can't listen to this. But sure enough, when they would do a search, it would be that band. And so they're oh, like, that's funny. So, we, so there's a band that we found on YouTube, you know, that like they're wearing ski masks. Is that you? And I'm like, <laughs> technically no, but they're named <laughs> after me. And so then, and then I, would have to, I would have to go through a whole explanation of like. You're like, I, listen, the scene of music that I'm into, <laughs> we like to crack jokes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
it's the spirit of me <laughs> yeah yeah it is yeah exactly i was like ah oh, it's not it's not really me but yeah so right. they, they, they did they did represent me to a whole slew of uh academic actually in the in the mid 2000s so thank you and also if any of you max ward people are listening out there i still want a shirt man you know i would love i would love to get a max ward shirt maybe i should bootleg one of their one of their shirts yo yes <laughs> bootleg your own graduation <laughs> photo yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i guess i did i guess i kind of ripped them off because for the banner you know will uh you know will had told me about you know making banners you know it's quite easy these days and you can use graphics and i was like oh shit i should just take a piss out of myself doing this and I'll put up my stupid graduation photo. So I guess I kind of ripped them off actually. They they use that graphic first. That yeah, is their man. that is their graphic. So yeah. I'm, st- I'm stealing their thunder. Yeah, dude. They came up with the idea to use your picture first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> I, I got uh, a couple that's... other bands I wanted to ask you about. Um I, it's just like, are we now in like the rapid fire? Yeah, I feel like, like I have so stage many of to live a lie podcast. Okay, no, I'm here. Thinking, like I really <laughs> gotta cook dinner right now. Sorry, y'all. Okay. Uh, I also made the mistake of asking Facebook if they had questions for you. So I think I'm gonna pile a bunch of questions in a row, and then you can see what you want to answer. Okay, um, ask Carl's speed, question. Speed round. So this is it. <laughs> this is the round before the speed round, but it's still oh, okay. like a triple question. Okay. Uh, I love the first Rambo LP. So wondering how you worked with Rambo. Uh, Punch was a great addition that seems a little outside of, like it's a little more on the like death wish type side of music. Yeah. And then uh, I'm sure everyone wants to know about working with Insect Warfare. And aside, uh, I think Bo approached me on their first EP and was like, hey, I'm in a band. You, you should put out our record and this was like a myspace message and i'm like i'm like you you have to go through like a channel here like i i don't know what you're like i hear the name of your band like i i know you're in a new band i i uh i i didn't fully look necessarily like his old band was good but it wasn't fully up my alley so i'm just like I oh, I don't know like can you, you weren't quite more? down with it right away basically you didn't give me any information to yeah, know that no, I get it you. was gonna be this gigantic thing that everyone yeah. wanted to love but Max was the first person to release their stuff I believe so yeah, you uh, clearly got the message better than I did so yeah uh, and it was all it was all just because of friendship you know I mean that's that's how most of this actually develops um, okay so Rambo first. Uh, their demo was floating around. Their demo is super good. And, um, you know, most of the time uh, when you hear a demo like that, you're like, hey, let's do an EP or something like that. But like, I thought the demo was so damn good. And clearly they knew, they, they had already found their style somehow. Um, I said, let's do an LP. And at the time, the singer, Tony, he, um, you know, he had enough ideas and everything. And, and Tony was like, Oh yeah, we, we got enough ideas for an entire LP. So th- this is on. I was like, okay, let's let's do it. And so it just it kind of came out of that. You know, it was just um, I had met them. I had met Tony at at Stalag in Philly when um, Spaz played there with Brutal Truth, and uh, really liked him. And we just stayed in contact. And you know, a couple of years later, he had Rambo, and uh, so we decided to do the LP with Punch. Um, uh, great band. And, you know, because of the blast beats and stuff like that, I mean, like, I think yeah. they, you know, fit within, uh, you know, the 625 banner. Um, they, some of them had done a band earlier called No Dice that I put that I put out their demo on a one-sided EP. That's really, really good. Super fast, straightforward, hardcore. And then once Punch started, um, at the time, uh, you know, it was one guy uh, from doppelganger which was a 625 band uh, and and then um my really really good friend dan africa was the the bassist of punch and so i was just like this is no brainer I'll, I'll help you guys and they didn't even need my help you know by that time you know they they were doing their own record label but i think they just 
probably out of kindness wanted some association with 625 so i was like of course i'll help you and you know i'll throw in on these releases and i'll put them through the channels you know my limited channels but in the early 2000s and and of course they you know of course they got super you know actually well received and and popular and continue to actually like work with me up until just like the last couple records and so i i felt really honored and you know and they were just really good people and good friends and still are yeah. with insect warfare um Bo had uh, started filling in uh, for Machine Gun Romantics. And so I was friends with, you know, Alex Hughes going all the way back to the Power Butt days when he was doing this power violence band called Power Butt, which are great. And everybody should look that up mm -hmm. right now. Um, and, uh, and so Machine Gun Romantics came out to California and stayed at my house. And Bo was like super excited. And he was just into everything. He was like, dude, I'm into like fast core and I'm into this. And, you know, I love Unseen Terror. Like the LP is like one of my favorites. Uh, I, love, like, I love Unseen Terror too. You know, <laughs> he's, like, he's like, I'm going to do a grindcore band. And so, you know, when he got back to Houston, I can't remember if Insect Warfare had already been playing by that point or it just started a little bit later. And he sent me like a rehearsal tape and I was like, dude, Bo, I'll do anything you want me to, you know, just, just you know let me know we can put out this rehearsal tape we can do whatever and you can tell they're they're kind of finding their style over a couple of eps you know yeah. so the first couple of eps i don't think you know people like had their you know minds blown but i was like damn you know this is a really good grind core it's coming from good people who really know their history you know and and all that stuff and then of course you know by the time the lp happened that that's like when all hell broke loose you know and clearly they had outgrown kind of like the the boundaries of my puny little label and stuff you know and so uh but you know that's happened a lot with me you know where i support bands that nobody knows of or, or who are just friends of mine you know put out a few releases help them kind of find their sound and then you know something strikes and all of a sudden you know they're they're quite big and then at that point they either decide to work with a bigger label that's more has a you know bigger distribution is more adequate for what they're doing or sometimes they they actually stick with me like internal rot has done that which is pretty crazy internal rot's just like they're you know, amazing yeah i'm yeah. sure i'm sure they could get signed you know by some you know big like relapse or some shit yeah. yeah or something you know and they've been you know i've known those guys and i know particularly max the uh, singer who was a drummer of Far Left Limit. So I've known them for going on decades, you know, going on over two decades. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll support them until the end, you know, uh, yeah. if, if, if they need it. But, you know, they clearly, you know, at some point, 625 is helping out a band and then the band is getting bigger. And then all of a sudden yeah. the band is pretty much like, we'll help you out, buddy. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. we'll, we'll do, we'll do our next record with you because, you know, maybe you need the help. And I think insect warfare is at that level now. They're just, you know, so, so good. And people are finally appreciating them and stuff. So. I mean, that's Definitely. the best thing a DIY label can do. I, I look back at being an early music collector in like the early two thousands and seeing the problems with like i'll just mention one label hyper realist i saw pat break baroness onto the world and i never owned any of their records but i saw like people were messaging me and was like you live really close to you live in the south you li don't live very far from pat i don't know where my pre-orders are for this like the whole world was waiting on these baroness records that i think he was so slammed with orders that he couldn't get them out and people were like what the hell is happening like it's it's awesome to have a band blow up but there's like too much of a blow up sometimes so like you and i run a label at a certain level but yeah. the relapse like other label is just such a different beast that i don't think you or i can handle it that well like yeah. i know you're not doing direct mail order right now and I'm doing that, but it it's hard to sit on top of these bands that deserve a better distribution and uh, et cetera. It's like, it's, it's great to be able to blow them up into the world and let them do more than we could have done for them. Yeah. You, you know, I have to say, I'm really impressed with Scotty tank crimes and, and what he did with Necrot, you know, like, 
I uh, love that Ke- fucking LP, man. Fucking great band. Really good people yeah. too. Really good people. And you know, like I, I don't know much about death metal these days, or I haven't met like too many members of death metal bands over the last like you know five, ten years or so. But I can say they are good people, you know. And Sonny specifically, like since the word, word salad days, you know, is just like a fucking great person. And you know, God love them, uh, Scotty you know, signs them, puts out their album and, you know, just pumped the crap out of it. Got them, you know, on the cover of Decibel and, you know, and all this stuff and still doing it as DIY as one can at that level, you know, like Tank Crimes is still, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're basically about the most active and biggest kind of like DIY, you know, still it is in his house. It is him and like, you know, Mark is helping him do the designs and promo stuff and everything. And he's doing the mail order. He's doing the order, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm like super impressed, uh, you know, by that. And it's hard. I think a lot of times for bands, I think it's hard for them to detect in the gray zone between keeping it DIY, not even DIY, let's just say authentic and honest versus that whole other realm where things are kind of taken out of your hands and it becomes like this weird, you know, I don't even know what it is business most definitely. Yeah. But there's a gray zone in the middle of that. And I think it's really hard for like, particularly new young bands, like they get kind of lost in that gray zone and they'll make some bad decisions. And next thing you know, they've, you know, they owe tens of thousands of dollars to some record label, you know, that they sold their, you know, soul to or whatever. But, um, but you know, like Scotty's an example of, you know, of like being able to like put out a quality death metal record that is basically as large as you can get and still, you know, have this fanfare, you know, and like lots of support and, you know, they're touring internationally and they're doing all this stuff. And I, I, you know, I think that's, that's great. Not everybody, you know, can do it. And also just watching Will's instagram feed every week of you know him brutalizing his mail person with you know three bins of you know mail you know every week of course you know i'm sure will you you get tired of you know doing that and it can be exhausting for a lot of people you know and you know at the end yeah the funny thing is (laughs) some of the things that i should have broken into the world i can't always break out there because Mm -hmm. i I have such a big mail order that there's less time for the promotion. The a good example is the Realize LP came out. Like I did a demo LP for the band Realize, who's members from Sex Prisoner, and uh, it's really cool God flesh industrial worshiping stuff. And I sat on those records forever. They got signed to Relapse and blew up instantly. And those records flew off the shelf where I should have done a better job as a label to say, Hey, like, this is going to be the next big thing. Y'all don't even know. Here's, here's why you need to check this out. And I, I know there's downfalls to what I do, like probably both of us, like you, you feel like you want to do the most for the bands you're working with. And there's only so many hours in the day or, uh, etc i'm sure cj feels the same thing too but all you can do is just yell from the cliff as many times as you can and hope someone hears it like um i mean i'm lucky to have worked with like acx dc who blew up sex prisoner who blew up uh gruder grind but gruder grind from the beginning uh this band spy that i just put out first release blew up Uh, dude that shit's hot everyone's fucking talking about that thing it's it's great to hear man i love it there's other things that should have blown up like i mean everything i put out should have blown up but i agree uh, oh dude man macago nt (laughs) especially that leah chate i caught that sitting around (laughs) (laughs) gotta rent my own merch someone has to yeah i I respect that shit dude but like the magnum force ep i put out it's uh this band from Arizona it sounds exactly like Magruder Grind. Like, like, yeah, they really do. It's funny. You put them side I to side, they're very similar. Uh, it's pre Coke bus. James moved across country and ended up being the guitar player, the second guitar, not the second main guitar player. 
he replaced like, another guy. He basically. replaced their guitar player. Yeah. Uh, and that EP sat around for a year. I sold like the first like 20, 30, 50, whatever. Then it sat around and then people finally woke up to it. So it, it's weird how things just sort of some takes time. Sometimes people never I'm going to go in your room, jump into it. But uh and then some yeah. stuff like Spy, like, I mean, I put out Spy on tape because I'm like, hey, y'all should shop this around, like, go wherever you want. Like, I really like this, but I can only do a tape for y'all. The tape sold out instantly. I did a second tape, sold out instantly. <laughs> Finally put it on. I'm like, we have to do this on vinyl. Like, yeah. I have no questions that this will do well. Yeah. Uh, six yeah. minutes in, the limited color sold out. Like Holy two days later, fuck. the whole press was sold out, um, which is not that weird. Like I put out this band Terminal Youth from uh, Boston. And if you look back, they're actually like them. members of a lot of bands that are awesome. Like I think it's pre Um I don't think they have curmudgeon members. Okay. Uh, but uh, oh, I'm spacing on names, but I can see his face. I think the one guy went into exit order I think maybe someone went into Boston Strangler. Like it was, it's like oh, wow. the best like Boston bands that blew up out of there had dudes in uh, Terminal Youth. And I think they did a word salad split on Moo Cow Records too, if I'm not incorrect. Um, I'm forgetting what my original thing I was talking about is now, but I feel like lots of stuff. And I, I'm sure you've seen that too, Max, that you're just like, I put this out like why is not everyone just like holy crap about this like i am and I'm going to your room because i gotta charge yeah i mean all, all you can do is just you know do your best and just kind of do it authentically you know and stay true like i'm trying to still you know 30 years on i'm trying to stay true to kind of like the original kind of ideals of 625 and that's like supporting newer bands and so you know some bands uh, get a lot of attention right away and that's great you know but there's going to be a all, there's going to be a bunch of bands that I'm going to put out that I know of it's going to take you know some time for them to get attention and, and that's okay you know and just yeah. try and kind of promote them as best I can you know if people like it people like it if people don't like it that's okay too but you know I'm just trying to get the stuff out that I want to support and um, and uh, you know I mean truth be told you know, near and 50, I probably don't have my thumb on the pulse of what, you know, the young kids are listening to these days. All I know is basically, you know, a lot of my friends' bands that I still want to support, a lot of the bands that kind of carry the spirit of, of the things that I was into, like in the, in, you know, in the 80s and 90s and stuff. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And, you know, if it, if it blows up, it blows up, you know, if it doesn't, that's okay too, because that's kind of what you know, the history of 65 has been as well, you know, for every, for every, uh, I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of like what's blown up, like, let's say Rambo or, uh, you know, what happens next record or something like that has come out, you know, behind that there's 10 or 15 smaller bands that I've put out, you know, and it's because of those bigger releases that I'm able to then put some of the money and energy to these smaller things that, you know, I might, yep have you know in stock over maybe a year or two or something um but that's you know that you just try and kind of balance it out you know and uh yeah that's what i try to do too and i know some people hate on like acx dc is not their idea of a straightforward grindcore band so they'll uh make fun of them especially because they're popular but i both like the music i like the people and it will sell so it i can take this and reinvest it on the new up and coming bands and I, I love the ability to do that yeah you know when I, easy, easy money to fund my band yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, you know That's when right. i was younger and and like so kind of in my small world of you know, collecting the, the, there was only like three grindcore bands, you know, Agathocles, Napalm Death and Fear of God, you know? And so you get into this like super small world, you know, and you're like, 
you start hating on other stuff and you know you like you know for me like it, it wasn't like i was you know publicly saying i hate this band or fuck pop punk or something like that but you know you get into this small stuff and start hating on stuff but you know the older that i've gotten you know the more i realize it's just really important about the people who are in the band you know and like if they're good people or bad people you know that basically is the main criteria for um who i want to work with these days is just like do i click with these people are they kind of like doing it in an honest authentic way or is this like some kind of cool thing that they're trying to promote or something that's maybe not really my thing you know my thing is more about these people who you know don't really care about like getting popular or anything like that you know so um even even for the people who make decisions about you know maybe making business decisions that i don't necessarily agree with um if i think they're good people and I trust that they've made that decision knowing full well what's been sacrificed by making that decision. Then I trust them that they've made that decision for a reason, you know, and so I'm, I'll, I'll give it to them, even if I'm not going to run my record label that way or, um, you know, or, you know, yeah, you know, that it's just a kind of a different world that they have now moved into. But, you know, they've made that decision. So that's OK. And if they're still good people, then they're good people. You know, I mean, the worst thing is, is yeah, I'm sure all of you can relate to this, you know, where there's some like local band and they're like young, you know, and you watch them kind of growing up and you, you love them at the beginning and, you know, and then it gets a little kind of complicated and they're seeing politics and then all of a sudden they either sell out or do something and you're just like, fuck, man, you know, like yeah. yet again, there's like this trajectory of like what could have been good and honest and, you know, people make bad decisions and, you know, turn into some bullshit, you know, corporate uh, you know underground band or something you know it's 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 unfortunate but north carolina bands don't last that long <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> we, yeah that's funny cj you were saying something um i forgot what i was just saying but i did i did have something i wanted to run by max well two things um what was cool about you know doing my homework earlier on the label slash whenever we were talking about gummo earlier um it it clicked for me that the same person who showed me gummo um also got me into a lot of 625 bands but it was never like oh check out this label it's like hey check out bloody phoenix check oh, out sick. plutocracy check out a um agents of abhorrence uh yeah. that was my buddy aaron to shield shouts out aaron thank um, you aaron Another tie-in, uh, that band I mentioned earlier that me, me and KJ were in, we were called Ragweed. Aaron was one of the main songwriters for that band. So I'm like, well, look, whole world's getting just a little bit smaller. Yeah, That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, you know, I mean, but, that's, um, that's how it is. And particularly in a scene like this, you know, if you travel, you know, when I was going to Japan before I could speak Japanese, like you could communicate, you know, because there, there were people there who had been ordering tapes just like you and into it, you know, and trying to get their friends into it. And maybe some of their friends were like, this is shit. I don't want to listen to it. You know, other people get into it, but you had some kind of connection. And then you like travel to Brazil and then you meet like, you know, I shot Cyrus or Descarga kids. And like, it's the same thing. It's like the same exact kind of like, you, you just know, like, we come from, you know, different countries, maybe different cultures, speak different language, you know, but actually, um, you know, we're actually part of this world, even though we didn't know it and we didn't know each other before it. But, you know, it's it's pretty cool. Like, you know, the 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 more you travel, the more you figure out like the that the, you know, world, particularly within punk. And, and that's what's so great. And that's like kind of what's shaped me as a human is just that, you know, there, there are you, you'll meet people throughout the world that you just instantly know like I've, I've done that i you know you understand me and i understand you even if we're having a hard time trying to speak through you know broken you know language broken english yeah. or my broken japanese or something you know um so yeah you know at the local level as well as the international level yeah before so, i get to my question actually just What's funny about Japan specifically is I think my band just had our first what could be a, a Japanese connection because um, I sell all, all of my band's merch through uh, Bandcamp. So I 
mail order everything. And uh, we just had this Japanese reseller um, buy out like all of our CDs and everything. And I just found the website like two days ago and I was reading like the Google Translate version of their uh, review of, of the um, album. And I was like, this is, this is so cool to see the words that I know also being compared to bands like sulfuric cartery they're like oh yeah oh. this i was like this is fun this is great yeah. i love this yeah but and, uh, see, and see whoever's writing that review really knows that world you know and so they can yeah. make those connections you know like who knows of sulfuric cartery you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? like, oh, there's probably like does, a, yeah you know there's like probably like you know 500 people you know who are like diehard fans of that band you know or, i mean probably more you know but and but one still. of them is that yeah. dude in oshaka he gets yeah. it yeah 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 awesome. <laughs> But uh, a question I had for you is fast question. So uh, I, I do not remember the song, um, but there's a lyric mm. that is about uh, this this guy I know, his name Finn McKinty, and oh, yeah. about his his mom yodeling in the bathtub. Because um, I know, like, I, I guess, I don't know a lot, but what I know think I know is that, like, all y'all are friends or something like that. So how did how did that come about? Well, he, he wrote us, I think we just started, you know, back in the day, it would have been called pen pal. I mean, now it's just like you email or maybe DM, I guess is the new term, but you know, back then <laughs> we actually had to write letters, you know? And so, you know, Finn McKenty uh, was living in Washington at the time, Washington state outside of, and he was into like graffiti, hip hop, metal and hardcore. And there was just all these references that, he saw in spaz records that also made him know that like, Oh, this is all the stuff that I'm into as well. So he wrote us and he came down and visited us. And uh, I think he was maybe a couple years younger, you know, at that time. And he was just um, along with Jeb actually to get back to the Jeb EP, like along with Jeb from the Crass Menagerie, he, you know, he was just like, uh, you know, not only a spaz fan but like just like part of our you know like he got it he got you know he, he he was trading photos of you know bombed freight cars you know in washington and sending it to us and we would send you know like you know things from graffiti walls from san francisco yeah. to him or whatever it was just you know it clicked and so he came down and visited a bunch of times and so you know spaz wasn't the smartest band and so we just basically wrote records about our friends and so we made a five inch that or a split five inch with gob uh pre-iron lung that mm -hmm. um that uh was all just a finn mckenty uh every song was about finn mckenty and i think oh, no way. <laughs> was, yeah you know and and um and we stayed in contact up through the late 90s i think by that point he had moved to ohio if I remember correctly, I think yeah. he was in Cleveland. Did that and, for a little bit. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then I can't remember how I came across the punk. Uh, what is it called? The punk NBA. Right? Yeah. Punk rock NBA. Yeah. Punk rock NBA. You know, it was one of probably the YouTube algorithm, you know, I uh, put uh, in like JFA or something. It was listening to the Valley of the Yakes album or something. And then all of a sudden like Finn McKenty comes up. I'm like, is that fucking Finn McKenty? You know? <laughs> And it's this video saying like, here's why I love despise you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, I was like, well, this is so weird, you know? And, uh, you know, I mean, I guess that's a thing now, you know, you have your YouTube channel and like, you know, yeah. you kind of like ex explain things like this is, yeah. you know, why this genre died out or this is, you know, where, why spaz was so important in the nineties or something. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and then a bunch of people started emailing us. So it was like, Finn got this wrong and Finn got that wrong. <laughs> I was yeah. like, you know, it's amazing. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was well, like, that's cool. I, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't talked to Finn probably in in twenty years. So, I, so I don't really know like where what he's doing or where he's coming from. Only just the YouTube yeah. uh, stuff. So, oh, he's super easy to get in touch with. If you leave him a comment on any YouTube video, he'll he'll respond back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I should. It's I should small reach world. Out. Yeah, I should reach out. To yeah, him. he's back in. Uh, he's back in Seattle now. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh, cool. That was the um, question. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I uh, I got a question um, about. Uh, hold on. Yeah, I got a question about you uh, working with Down in Flames because that oh, band yeah. fucking rips. 
Um, did forget. they like, did they hit you up or did you hear them first or cause they're from New Jersey, I think. Yeah. Th- their tape was just floating around, you know, and okay. that's, that's also why they got released almost simultaneously. Like Nate gloom records, you know, released their EP. Um, uh, I think dead alive did something with them and, and I did all, all within kind of the same year. I mean, they, they were really young. They were high school. Guys. Yeah. I heard, I, I've, I've heard, I've heard stories um, about how the singer was like 15 or some shit. You know? Yeah. They, they, they were pretty young and, but they just came out with both guns blazing, man. And so I think everybody was just like, you know, all of us were like in our late twenties maybe at that time or early thirties. And then, you know, here comes this band who's like 15, 16, 17, just like ripping and we're, and everybody's like, fuck it, support them, you know, get like support them as much as possible. And so, yeah, that's how the LP came about. Uh, and classic death did a, a tour with them on the West coast in support of that LP. And, you know, the, and they stayed at the house and it was just so funny because, you know, by that, t- I think I was probably maybe 30 by that point, 29, 30, maybe, yeah. uh, we, you know, with my then partner, you know, we're living in this small like apartment in San Francisco, you know, and she was just like, who are these young kids, man? You know, they're like farting on each other and stuff yeah. like that, you know, <laughs> like, you know, it was like, it was like babysitting a little bit, you know, but it was, it was kind of yeah. cool. I was like, I was like, the, 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 you know, dude, they, they're this sick band. What are yeah. you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's down yeah, yeah. in flames. <laughs> yeah. Eli, you want to hear a small world? Yeah. Situation what's up? here. Uh, you are on a X down in flames comp. So oh, Ian Thompson is on to live alive in, volume uh, two. It, on in that band Soft Dove. Yeah. Hell yeah, they were sick too, man. I haven't even heard them. I gotta, I gotta go check that uh, out. Soft Dove, two words. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's, it's, it's spelled kind of funny. Um, dove without an e at the end and an umlaut on the first o. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Soft um, Dove. And uh, that dude, Mark Bronzino, was in that band too, right? Yep. Fuck yeah, yeah. They were cool. They were a good band. Um, yeah. And Pete, Pete, the drummer from Down in Flames, he was a really tall kid uh whew, he was friggin' fast man dude so, yeah. yeah it was a pleasure watching him just kind of like you know because he 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 sat pretty kind of tight with the drum set you know and everything was like kind of just right there but man he for how young he was he was he ripping that drum set man super good yeah i i listened to the lp today uh and man yeah it still fucking holds up that shit is crazy yeah, it's really good, good. yeah good yeah band. yeah they uh there was another release they did i'm not sure what it's on but they they do a cover of who are you why am i here by void oh, yeah. and yeah. it's just, it's it's honestly i think it's better than the fucking void version yeah it just yeah. it's it's a little more put together but uh yeah good band yeah good, good band, band for sure and they know their history like clearly doing void covers and stuff like that yeah. they know you know oh, they yeah. trace it back to you know, that kind of stuff rather than like, you know, just focusing specifically on, you know, whatever, What's like going, the media. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What was going on around them at the time or something. Yeah. Yeah. All right, All right Max, are you ready for a lightning round? I've got like probably 30 questions. <laughs> Holy shit. Are you kidding me? Okay. God okay, let's, damn. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Hold on. Let me, let me get into the mental space. I, I'm going to tell Shoot. you the person's name. I'm going to try to not mess up what they do just to remembering who they are because it's Facebook and there's so many people on there uh, and then give you the question and then let you give a quick response. I'm going to skip over some of the uh, sillier questions that I just want to skip over. But Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's keep be, it. Let's keep it. What, what, what might be useful. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the first one is funny, but I'll, I'll leave it out there. Uh, Carl Redux, who I think does acid Redux uh, productions asks what your favorite kind of taco is anything vegan man but I'll, I'll eat basically any any taco like and and living in japan so i'll be in japan no tacos no mexican food oh, like no. you can't yeah pinto beans hard to find you know oh, wow. and so uh when i come back i mean hell i'll even be at the airport i'm like fuck it they got a chipotle fuck it you know like i'm gonna hit that up even though i know it's not authentic but like my first thing is like ah, fuck it yeah. If, you, yeah. if you had your choice of a vegan taco bar, which would it be? Would you go for nopales or 
a tofu taco. I, you know, I think, does. I think, yeah, pr- uh, I keep my stuff like pretty simple, actually. Like when it, when it comes down to burritos, like I don't like try and douse it with all the different uh, vegan concoctions that they've come up with. I'm basically like a rice, beans, pico de gallo, maybe a little guac in there. You know, I keep it pretty simple, but I'm down. I'm, I'm, I'm down to try whatever, as long as it's vegan. That's count me in. Cool. Uh, I got one guy who asked like eight questions. I'm trying to see if I know exactly who he is. I apologize. Uh, there are too many questions and <laughs> I'll just say his name. Eric Elman asks. Uh, oh, dude, Eric Elman. Oh, okay. <laughs> I probably should they, know who he is. <laughs> Eric Elman from They Live. Oh, okay. That's yeah, why yeah. he's asking about why. Uh, Eric, Eric. Asking why Buffalo is the best <laughs> town on the East Coast. Oh, dude, Buffalo is. <laughs> dude, but you know, when all this stuff was happening, particularly in the, in Redwood city. So in like the West Bay of the, of the peninsula, um, you know, one of the only other scenes that was kind of going off as small and kind of, you know, it wasn't like New York city and it wasn't, you know, Minneapolis or something like that, you know, Buffalo, I mean, it's a second city, you know, it wasn't Chicago or something like that, but man, man, they're fucking bands, you know, and they live, I mean, they live is just hands down, like one of the, one of the best. So we, we have nothing but, but love and there's a clear connection between you know we're on the same radio waves let's say between kind of like what was happening in redwood city and, and buffalo and stuff so cool uh reminder there are like 30 questions so okay. <laughs> i'm not trying to okay i'll be i'll be quick about things but okay uh another buffalo person below him uh michael gifford you should recognize oh, yeah. that name yeah, yeah mike gifford uh what up mike He's asking how many copies of the Running for Cover EP and LP were pressed. <laughs> you probably don't know. It's probably on Discog somewhere. I, w- I was going to mention <laughs> run, Running for Cover too because they fucking they rock. They they destroy. And gas my, chamber. My my guess would be a thousand because that was kind of the go to number of what I was pressing in the late nineties. Even though Running for Cover was early to mid two thousands, I I would say a thousand maybe. It could have been 500 each. I'm not exactly sure. I can I can actually probably dig around and find that out though. Yeah. So Mike, Mike, if you if you were if if you're really seriously needing to know, let me <laughs> email me and I'll figure that out for you. Discogs did not help me here. Um, here's uh, Eric from Body Farm, and he runs uh, uh, a label slash uh, zine that I can see it in my head. It starts with so something something, uh, just spacing right now. But he's asking which is more comfortable, being behind drums and shredding, or being the upfront hype man vocalist. We already sort of answered that one. I think I think behind the drums, uh, but I would have to qualify that answer. Not necessarily shredding, like on the brink of <laughs> of n- not holding it together but I, I still feel more comfortable with an array of cymbals and drums that are separating me from the mayhem yep. yeah yeah uh, i would have to agree with that <laughs> <laughs> eric elman like i said bombarded some questions uh who owns the three they live taste of the good life test presses do you know who's who has those test presses eric is this a trick question do, do you have these test presses <laughs> probably does <laughs> Um, do I have these test presses? Maybe I, I mean, maybe they got lost in the mail. I I don't know what the hit, the history behind this is. Damn Eric. We'll, we'll keep going. Email Uh, me. Would you consider jelly roll rockets a band or a religion? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, a great side project, you know, the stars aligned and yeah, I mean, whew, great band, great band live too. Uh, I'm trying to quickly see who this is. I can't quite quickly tell. I, I apologize if I should know who you are, but again, I have too many Facebook friends and post this in a couple groups. But uh, Roger Palamares asked, uh, says that you're one of his favorite drummers. Thank Why you, did Roger. he choose drums? Why did you stick to one pedal? I Most fast drummers went the double puddle route. Uh, and I think it's rad. He can blast with one, one pedal. Barely. I, I have a super soft foot. I don't know if if you listen to all those records, my, my foot's pretty soft. I mean, I'm no Dave. I'm no Dave Witty with the with the single pedal, man. That's for sure. Um, 
uh, why did I go with drums? Cause the bands that I, even minor threat or seven seconds, if you listen to the, like when you listen to Troy Moat playing on seven seconds, like the crew, you can just hear the drums. Like I, I think the intensity and the speed of those bands came from the drummers. And so, you know, live, I would go see the bands, but I would stand to the side and I'd try and watch what the drummer was doing even before I knew how to play drums or what even the drums were. But I, for whatever reason, I was always kind of drawn to drummers, you know, like original DRI drummer or, you know, just stuff like that. Just trying to figure out what the hell are they doing? How are they playing that fast, right? <laughs> uh, my buddy, Chris Zilich, uh, he's contemplating relocating uh, with Burlington as a potential. Oh. How are you liking uh, having come from the Bay Area and relocating there? Well, uh, I had some time in between. Uh, so New York and Tokyo was about uh, eight years. The separated my move from the Bay Area in 2004 by the time that I arrived to Vermont in 2011. Burlington's cool. Burlington's, uh, you know, it's only 40,000 people, but it's a university town. Um, in all the craziness that's just happened over this last couple of years, you know, not only with like the rise of the right, but also the pandemic. It's been pretty sensible, you know? So it's it's a good small town. It's got a good um, like uh, punk uh, scene as well, you know, and good people. So, you know, if you're looking for a little small town, you know, living, Burlington, you know, can't do you wrong. Just be prepared for the winters because the winters <laughs> here are brutal, man. Yeah, he was living out in Seattle a while ago. So I, I don't know if that's the same kind of winter, but... Uh... <laughs> it, it's rain out there, but I mean, it gets cold, man, because we're right on Lake Champlain. So we get the lake effect and it just comes over and just freezes uh, yeah. the town, man. All right. To keep things up going, uh, here's a buddy from Winston-Salem, Michael Magdan, uh, I'm bad at last names, Magdaleno asks about uh, how about them hogs? Does that mean anything to you? How about how, them hogs? How about them hogs? Maybe All I can think... <laughs> I, I would say i would say in relation to that i would say uh great band nuclear armed hogs with uh ken sanderson from prank on vocals playing with the schlong guys so that go 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 listen to that on youtube great band nuclear armed hogs and they actually played a fiesta grande i believe as well uh jerry gutierrez says uh Dude, jerry. You, thank you yeah i love jerry he takes photos jerry. right he's a photo guy uh oh. yep yeah it looks like he plays music because Wait, I see is, how... it, is it is it not the 976 drummer uh he's got a bass in front of him and a picture hold on hold on <laughs> am i getting my jerry's mixed up how can i get my jerry's mixed up man he looks very familiar let me look to have messaging with them. I don't think I'm Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Jerry, Jerry976, man. Look, Jerry, Jerry and I go back like oof, 30 plus years. And he, he was, you know, I mean, uh, still a close friend and somebody that I look up to and taught me a ton about drums and just being a good person. And just, he's rad, man. He's rad. And also the drummer of uh, Evolved to Obliteration, that band that I, Oh, tried cool. to sing horribly in but yeah jerry was a drummer oh yeah yeah uh, I, hope to, I, I wish i could play with jerry again man that, that's like a dream shit. i assume this person's not got his real name on here someone from arizona his name is christ at war which i'm guessing is just the internet name but uh he asked about a spaz reunion which i'm guessing is a no no you know what spaz is 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 best enjoyed <laughs> with all the samples on a record. You know, you don't want to see a bunch of middle-aged, slightly flabby guys <laughs> trying to play fast who, who probably can't play that fast anymore anyway. I say, let let the young bucks do it, man. You know, like- I, know, I, saw, I saw Chris play in Infest. He still plays fast, plenty of good. Yeah, it's true, it's true. You know, he's plucking he's plucking the four strings pretty, and also Dan, you know, Dan's playing in Hard Foul and doing like a bunch of bands. I, I guess uh, maybe- I didn't, okay. Yeah, I me, love that me, fucking split, man, with yeah, these bastards. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, it's an awesome split, man. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess maybe I should just speak for myself. You don't want to see me 
the middle-aged fat <laughs> drummer trying to play uh that fast anymore because right. yeah who who wants to be let down right it'd be like oh shit we go, let's go see spaz and then you say and you're like mm, it wasn't very good we're and like, i will <laughs> take all the credit for that <laughs> we're like a third of the way through uh david tamio jr did he enjoy feeders and did he ever watch them live feeders the band feeders yeah, it seems so oh yeah i mean dude feeders uh i mean that's like legendary feeders uh i don't think i've ever seen the feeders live though unfortunately but i yeah, had their had their records good old uh teachers in space and uh teachers in space right i got that right i think so <laughs> uh let's see it looks like this person is from egypt uh say bak why uh asked if you'll redo your high school graduation hair you, you don't look like you have the problem I do, so you could probably grow it back out. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but with people with curly hair, though, I mean, really curly hair, the problem is that mid-length. I mean, I, I will have just, it's not even like an afro. It's just going to be some weird kind of something. So I think I'm going to be sticking with this for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh let me see. I had the other ones queued up there. I posted in the six through five group that I started and my page and the to live a lie page. So I got a couple different places. Uh, Marlon Damn, Moreno. Your... Oh, sorry. Uh, Marlon Moreno. Uh, why hasn't he done a proper life's halt discogs? Why hasn't anyone done that for, for that matter? I, you know, I don't know, actually, I, th that's probably up to the band. And I, I would assume that either they or I would assume Youngblood would probably be the, the, the place to do it. I, I would, of course, in any way, help out. But I, I don't know if there's maybe some uh, disagreements in the band about about that or, or how to do it. Um, but I mean, of course, should it exist without a doubt? Should it be on vinyl? Of course. Should it be a double LP? Yes. You know. Well, it sounds like you should reach out to the band. Is what I'm hearing. Okay, I can, I can, I can try. I'll, I'll, I, I, I know, I know where some of them are, so I'll reach out to them. Um, Count me in for a co-release. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump yeah, over a bunch of people here. Uh, I got a good one here. Uh, Aaron McDonald, ask him if if what's his face from green day actually did steal his drum stool tray cool or whatever uh i remember hearing that somewhere yes uh <laughs> that is the content of that's the that that's the meaning behind the spaz song thrice the hiney uh <laughs> when when plutocracy i think it was plutocracy played with M, uh, mr t experience uh when he was playing drums for them uh, they showed up without a drum set and borrowed my drums, which I'm totally fine doing. But uh, when they took off, uh, my throne was gone. And I was like, huh. I was like, that's weird. Did they just steal my throne? <laughs> Mr. T experience? You know, like, and that was, that was at the pizza place that I was telling you about at the beginning. Pony yeah. Express Pizza. Yeah. So it was a plutocracy Mr. T experience show, if you can believe that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, minus, minus my drum throne. Uh, we got Not okay. No. from... Fabi Han, who I think is doing the Scholastic Death discography on tape or yeah, yeah. something yeah, like Germany. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's asking about your Lonely Island. Uh, if you have to go to Lonely Island and you have to take the discography of one band with you, uh, which one would you choose? Uh, probably Heresy. I don't know. Mahavishnu Orchestra. I don't know. Maybe John Coltrane, Giant Steps. I mean, one record. I would say Napalm Death up until Mentally Murdered. I don't know. Someone said that you would probably bring a Gathicles discography, I'm guessing, because <laughs> of the size of it. Yeah, um, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, that would get you through, like, at least the first six months of continuous Mince core play. Right? <laughs> uh, let's see. Jeff DeSantis, who I believe is in Wallbreaker, unless I'm saying the wrong band that he's in, and Hopefully I didn't say that wrong, but uh, he's asking what your favorite spaz sample is. Favorite spaz sample? I think probably actually uh, it comes down to what Eli was talking about, about the, the, um, the videotape of 
uh, that parents are supposed to rent from the Blockbuster video to show them if they think their kid is uh, being initiated into a gang. And so how to tell that. And so like if, if they've taken on like a little a, a, a nicknames like Mad Dog and things like that, I think that th those are some pretty funny samples, I think. Um, was it was it y'all that had the uh, no? It was a Charles Bronson one that had the. Uh, do y'all have any Charles Bronson like phone call to a record shop? Oh yeah. They're like, they're like, what's what's that? And they're like, do you have any One Life crew? <laughs> yeah. One Life crew is like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's Bronson. That was, that, that's um, a good one. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite Spaz samples. I uh, I think it was on La Revancha. It's like, hey Tommy. Have you been practicing your 360 on your oh. skateboard? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was hey, go pop to that. a wheelie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was listening to that that today, and I was just like, man, this is. I love this shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Between the three of us, we would just scour, you know. And this is before the internet, so you had to get everything on like VHS or like audio tape. And so we would bring yeah. into the studio just stacks of stuff and have to drop it onto analog tape, you know, to do it all. Uh, and Bart Thurber, who's the best engineer, love that guy, and he's still recording, um, used to splice it in, splice it into the actual master one-inch tapes, you know, all those samples, man. And it was because of Bart's magic splicing techniques that, that you know, that, that we were able to do all those uh, samples, you know. Yeah, I love them. Definitely, I don't know, it, it, it just adds something to it, you know? Yeah. The hip hop yeah, yeah. samples along with the funny ones, you know? Yeah, yeah, it just, it, it, it worked for whatever reason, you know? But we were bringing all our influences and our humor, different humor, right? You know, but still the three of us all contributed to that. And it, and it you know, it kind of clicked when you hear it all back to back, you know? Yeah, for sure. All right, there's still a ton of questions. So I'm just gonna say, the questions and then whatever you want to pick up later and talk okay. about is fine. Okay. Um, someone's asking about your favorite 65 release. Someone's okay. asking about signing up for your Japanese history class, how to do oh. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Matt Needles from uh, Chess Pain uh, is asking who's the, fa the fastest drummer you've seen live. Mm. Um, I, I know you're going to want to answer some of these, so just feel free to jot them down or whatever. Yeah, that's what I'm doing um, right now. Uh, Rudy, uh, I'm totally spacing on what label he does. Uh, Carrillo, uh, what was his time in the meat shits like and <laughs> did he ever regret it or have a good time? Um, someone said that he didn't think you liked what, talking about that. So feel free to skip over that if you want. Okay. Um, what were Dan and you like in high school and who did they, and who did they start jamming with originally? I guess there's a good story behind that. Um, earliest demos he and bands played with. Uh, this is all Rudy. Uh, God, I, I should know here. I'm just clicking through my, my brain doesn't always click in who people are, but I know Rudy and I'm just, I'm spacing uh well i'm just gonna read all those questions then um uh how much did he make from the sake of his once less legendary record and demo collection i guess you sold off your records uh yep. does he plan to stream release to stream release a 625 channel on a platform with all releases i guess that'll be your band camp uh what re releases never came to be on 625 he wished would and why didn't they um so so we're past rudy's questions here's my right, we should stop there there's so <laughs> many yeah but there's still so many more like i'm gonna just uh, we'll have them. to do a part two or something i don't know <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll rip through this quick <laughs> yeah uh, Signing up for a history class, uh, if you're a Middlebury student, easy enough. If not, there's maybe ways to do it. You can email me, uh, maybe even email the registrar. You can audit a class. Nice. Uh, uh, fastest drummer, I, maybe not the fastest, but one of the best drummers I ever saw live was Matt from Capitalist Casualties because he played open-handed. Open 
So when he went fast, it wasn't, you know, he wasn't crossing on the hi-hat. He was, he had his hi-hat and ride and he hit hard, you know? And so when he's hitting blast beats, it's not like wrist. I mean, it is like full arm blast beats and stuff. I mean, he, he, he was punishing, uh, uh, collection, the selling of the collection of demos. I don't know how much I made, but it did help me get through graduate school. Nice. And that was, that was a very painful thing to do. What releases do I wish? Uh, I wish I put out a Mind Evasion uh, record. I love that band. Uh, but Sound Pollution did it, and Sound Pollution's a better label, so that's that's <laughs> all good. And I, I wanted to do the Charles Bronson LP, too, because I just I love them, and they were close oh. friends. But, you know, of course, Lengua Armada and Martine, you know, is the obvious choice there, and also, you know, a bigger label. So, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to do one last big batch. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, Mike Sorry, Nel I know I missed some stuff in there, but <laughs> no, that that works. Mike Nelson from Gasp asks if he misses uh, pounding forties and listening to Roshack in the car with you. He says <laughs> to tell you hello. Yo, um, what's up? And get, I'm still pounding forties and listening to Roshack, dude. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Jack Rice asks uh, six two five as a graph crew pre-label. Yes, uh, I guess you're throwing graph for six two five before you did the label is what what that's telling me maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. the The label was was supposed to be called West Bay Thrash, but I was talking to from Frank of Agents of Satan. He's like, you can't call it thrash because everybody's going to think it's thrash metal. And I was like, yeah. fuck, man, what do I call it? And so at the time, there was a graffiti crew O A K over Overthrow All Kingdoms that on a phone. If you spell out O A K, spells out six two five, and I was like, fuck it, I'll just call it six two five for now. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I assume that was your area code for some reason. But yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, at the, at the time that I started 65, I think the entire Bay Area was 415, but then it switched to uh, 650. Hmm. Uh, uh, Andrew Neighbors' favorite slap of hand release. I'm going to just go ahead and go through them. Okay. Uh, Patrick Trainer, is there any unreleased Bombs of Death material hanging around? And can we have it, Good please? Question. Good question. <laughs> Uh, Tommy Wall from uh, Tomb Warden up in DC. I love Tommy. Asking, uh, anything and everything about Bombs of Death. So we got two Bombs of Death questions. Damn. Uh, getting towards the end, Lisa Oglesby, which I Lisa I that we Lisa. wanted to shout out. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's the ebullition. Yeah, person? yeah, Lisa. Yeah. Cool. She Hugs she's listened Lisa. to every To Live a Live podcast, so big oh, shout outs. Yeah. yeah, cool. That's awesome. Uh, she thought she was too late to ask a question. I told her she wasn't, but then it's been 30 minutes since then. So it's probably too late to ask a question. So just giving her a shout out. And then uh, Nick from Coke Bus said it'd be uh, not a question, but he thought it'd be funny if you pronounced it 625 instead of 625. Oh, that's good. <laughs> or what, 62 and a half, maybe. <laughs> But uh, that's surprisingly all the questions we got. So uh, cool. So favorite Slapaham release? Damn man, that's a tough one. I but, I mean probably Neanderthal. You know, I mean, but there's so many. Um, I like the ones that go under the radar too. The Anarchist uh, Monastery Split LP. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, dude, great, great death metal. Early, early death metal uh, anarchist from Mexico. Uh, put out probably one of the best EPs ever called Final Fall of the Gods. It sounds like septic death, but but like death metal, it's crazy. Um, Bombs of Death. So we recorded two songs, Bombs of Death, that were metal. Th so this is Steve Heritage from ASEC and I doing a side project. And one of the one of the guys from Locus uh, happened to be in the studio and was doing vocals for it. Uh, Bombs of Death. Those two songs came out on the Acrid split, but there's two songs of D-Beat where we, where it was going to be a different band, not Bombs of Death, but I think it was going to be Bombs of Death in Swedish. So we were we were trying to do kind of like I don't know, Disfear kind of you know stuff, Dis Machine or something. So there are two songs out there uh, that were recorded. Um, and am I missing something? What did I miss? <laughs> I mean, there's I so go, much. I'm sure it's fine if you skip over stuff. And I have to say again, Lisa and Kent from Evolution. Have, awesome people yeah and i will stick with them to the end you know because they've they've got great ethics they're good people lisa taught me 
you know, like we always say DIY, DIY, do it yourself. Well, you can run into a lot of problems as kind of like individualism, you know, and this is actually a collective endeavor. And Lisa always taught me, no, it's do it together, do it together. You know, and I'll always remember that DIT, DIT, yep. you know, and, uh, you know, ebullition and Lisa and Kent have supported me, you know, and really helped me out and stuff like that. And, you know, I got nothing but love for ebullition until the day I died. So, uh, so yeah, and they've taught me valuable ethics and to stay true to my ethics in politics, you know, yep. so, you know, they, they helped to live a lie at the very beginning too. Uh, I wrote some distributors and was like, Hey, like I've got this McGur grind God Stomper split. And they're like, I don't know what that is. I'm not going to deal with you and felt very like shut down instantly. And ebullition was like, uh, I mean, clearly God Stomper being a West coast, that was easy. But then Rhino charge was in the last heart attack and they, they probably sold a full thousand copies of that. Um, yeah. The band broke up and I was still selling copies without a problem, thanks to them. Uh, yeah. They've continued to be a helpful source of uh, distribution for me and really nice people. Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes down to stuff, uh, particularly distros or record labels, I, you know, a record label can focus on a kind of music and that's that's their principles or whatever. And, you know, distro is like, you know, doing a good distribution, I guess, is also their principles. But I, I want something more than that, you know, and ebullition from day one um, has been more than that because they got, you know, a certain set of ethics and politics. And, you know, I agree with those. And, and you know, uh, the, the commentaries and heart attack zine that they did and the kinds of bands that they put out might be very different from 65, but it's those are my ethics you know and i want to work with people who still you know kind of will put those ethics above you know business practices or whatever and stuff and so you know i uh i really appreciate ebullition and again we'll work with them till till the day i die so and i i personally have one last question uh i know we didn't bring up i guess i could bring up a couple questions um but uh we didn't bring up your time in capitalist casualties and uh there was no mention of masha vass yeah. uh, which i don't personally know a ton about but i mean clearly you did it for a long time but i think that really predated me getting into this kind of music and i know it was generally important yeah so two uh capitalist casualties they asked me once you know matt and them parted ways I was really nervous at the beginning because Matt is on another level. And I was like, I can't, I can't do that. You know? And, and if, if you allow me to join your band, I'm going to bring you down a couple notches, you know, and I probably actually did, you know, but I think we talked about it and Jeff was like, well, you know, our style is going to change a little bit. We might, you know, go like a little more kind of old school punk rather than just like full on double bass and blast beats, you know, which Matt could do really well. And I, I could, I couldn't. So, um, but man, Geraldo, you know, the third drummer, he fit yep. Capitalist perfectly. Uh, you know, so hearing me play in the middle of Geraldo and Matt, you know, like I, I, I'm I, not the fit for Capitalist Casualties, even though I really had a great time playing with them and it was really honored that they asked me to. But like hearing Geraldo play with them and hearing, you know, what Matt, you know, Matt's original drumming, I mean, it was just like, oh shit, the two great friggin drummers uh did you only play live or did you play on a recording yeah yeah no i played i played on like subdivisions in ruin oh, lp yeah. oh cool yeah i that's, played that's the first uh, one i ever heard yeah i played on the 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 play five inch oh, yeah dark yeah, circles and, yeah and played on a drug uh what is it drug war no drug, drug uh the EP that came out on Slap Ham, I can't remember. It's a little more punky than the earlier stuff. Uh, and that was the first time that I recorded with them. It was like maybe 95, I think, 96. Hmm. Um, as far as Masha Vass, of course, for those of you who know, I'm getting that from a Rose Rose LP from, from Japan. Because yeah. I never understood what, what that meant. But there was Mosh in the name and I was like, fuck it, Mosh, you know, that's cool, <laughs> Masha Vass. But um uh you know by the late 90s i was getting so many tapes both from 625 but also spaz uh on tour people would give me stuff people would send me cdrs of their new bands and i felt bad if i couldn't try and do something with getting you know this stuff because you know some people were like maybe asking about like 625 releasing them or something and so i said well 
one thing I'll do is I'll just um, make a little free one sheet demo review thing with all with all the contact addresses. So this isn't going to waste, you know, and I'll review everything that I get. And so I did, you know, some of it would be like Screamo, some of it would be like noodly tech grind metal, some of it would be hardcore, some of it would be thrash, some of it, whatever. So I just reviewed because I, I just felt bad, like I was getting all this stuff and I was into it but there's no way for me to support these bands. And so I was like, oh, well, I'll start Mosh of Ass to do that. And yeah, it kind of got bigger and bigger. And luckily, you know, by the time it stopped a couple of years later, Maximum Rock and Roll started their tape review section again, which like Robert was doing and stuff. So that was, yep. that was good. There was still a way for like demos to get, you know, reviewed and stuff. So, so yeah. I have a random Robert question for you. Uh, yeah. I'm friends with him on Instagram and he does these elaborate like toast food. Like I, I don't entirely know what it is. I've never seen anyone do it before, but he like, he puts his meal, like, I don't know if he eats it that way, but was he doing that when you were in bands with him? Is that something you know about? Do you? <laughs> well, well, Robert and Caroline, uh, who I love dearly, um, uh, and we would go on tour together. Caroline would 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 you know come with us. She was part of part of what happens next any more than, you know, uh, uh, you know Devin or Craig or I or anything. And um, yeah, they would just they make really elaborate like vegan meals, and they would often do that for um, people like around the holidays that were away from their families, you know, or didn't have families. And so you know, um, they would invite me over and make really elaborate you know, food for either Thanksgiving or something like that. And so it doesn't, doesn't surprise me that Robert's making some crazy daily toast concoction, you know, cause they experiment with all different kinds of like vegan, you know, ingredients and stuff. They're not, you know, foodies. I wouldn't call them foodies. They're just, you know, really into good food and vegan food and, and experiment with it. So. Yeah. Just, it looked like deconstructed sandwiches, but then there was like all kinds of symmetry and like, the tofu's all cut perfectly and I, I didn't know if they like you eat pieces or if you then after you lay it out nicely you put it onto a sandwich I, I just I was a little confused with that but no, knowing uh, Robert cool. he's he's eating the full sandwich I think he's just showing <laughs> you like the the ingredients you know the step-by-step -step. very cool uh well I know I just I know we're getting towards three hours here um I don't have a lot more I know I've taken a lot of your time. I don't know if Eli or CJ or if you want to talk about any particular topic. We, we lost Dylan, man. He, uh, yeah. <laughs> he said he went to let out his neighbor's dog and then I think he lost connection maybe. Okay. Well, tell, tell him it was it was nice to meet him and I wish we could have talked more. Yeah. Eli hey, you can, sort of... you can prank call him now. Too, oh, that's right. That's number. right. I got his number. Maybe, maybe yeah, I'll have dude. to hold it up to the camera so everybody <laughs> has, has his number. <laughs> um. I, I, uh, I don't have any more questions for you, man. I just wanted to say thank you for talking to us, you oh, know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I appreciate fuck, man. the invite. Yeah. Man. I, I got into spaz when I was like 14, 15 years old. So, you know, this is a very cool thing to be talking to you, man. I appreciate yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it too. I mean, I'm just, I'm grateful that people even care, you know, and still, <laughs> you know, like want to talk about this stuff and, and also are educating me on what's going on, you know, since I've been kind of disconnected and like learning about new stuff and new bands, much better bands than I think <laughs> anything that I did, you know, back in the, in the nineties and stuff. But I know there's like, you know, th that stuff's valued as well. And I appreciate it. Oh yeah. Definitely yeah. valued. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Thank, thank you, Eli. Eli, of course, if, man. Not, if it's not embarrassing to ask, can you show off your, uh, your no comment tattoo? <laughs> if you don't want <laughs> oh, to right, man. Yeah, you're gonna see my nipples, but uh, there it is, right there. Oh, so it's dude. downsided, dude. Yep. Sick. <laughs> Raul, yeah. Raul, the drummer. Oh he, my he, god, dude. He, he He's was. A, yeah. There, there was uh, one Shea Cafe show that I went to in San Diego where I stood next to him just to kind of see how he played drums, and it was just killer. You know, like not not blast beat, like not like a grindcore blast beat, but like a, a authentically hardcore punk yeah beat, you know how he did it it was like like amazing. like the scissor beat just times a million you yeah. know yeah um yeah. yeah dude that's one of my favorite hardcore that's one of my favorite 
music releases ever. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, yeah, it's up there. And if if I can qualify my earlier Slap a Ham release record, most definitely the the downside of EP is, is yeah. most definitely up there. For sure. CJ. Max. What's up, dude? <laughs> basically out of questions that i want to ask on the podcast hey so we're going to collaborate on releasing something is that is that what i detected from the earlier mention yeah. okay let's, that let's was do the, it, man. after the podcast question okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then no, I, 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 yeah I, I love doing that too because you know it's one of the it's just like working with a band working with other labels you know you get to like you know learn about different stuff and also like get to meet people through those you know collaborations and stuff and so again lisa do it together you know that's that's kind of what it's all about so, yeah, yeah. Like, i've never heard that until today i like that a lot yeah, yeah. me too man i'm gonna I'm keep that in mind for yeah, sure yeah. dit i like that a lot yeah yeah you know? lisa lisa <laughs> yeah shout out to her yeah for sure and I, i've become lifelong th friends with bands that i never heard of just dealing with you like i know we linked up on maybe the bloody <clears throat> phoenix record and then you're like, hey, you want to do this Get Destroyed record? And I'm like, I don't know what this is. Oh, this is sick. Like the final draft and all that stuff. I still keep touch with a lot of those people. Jay uh, from Get Destroyed, uh, I've continued to put out stuff for him. And he actually uh, fixed all my bad recording of the Tired of Everything stuff and spent probably hours uh, fixing my recording problems with Eli's drums and cleaned it up and uh, did a great job on that. And that was all from just a get destroyed connection. They, his uh, not gay kiss, but uh, burnout. Did burnout play Raleigh? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Burnout yeah, played Raleigh and awesome. that was a great show. And uh, yeah. so it's, it's been really cool to, to be friends with you over these years, Max. And yeah, uh those early those co-releases we did just sold well because people still knew the 625 name yeah. and they didn't maybe necessarily know my name and that that helped to balloon them out there which is great yeah well i loved like working with you and still do of course but you know like at that time in the early 2000s th there was only so many labels that i saw who were doing things that i could understand and relate to and who I thought were doing what I, you know, similar, something similar to what I was doing. And it was you and, you know, Paul give praise, you know, were like yeah. the two people that I was mainly collaborating with at that time, just because I was like, okay, we get it. You know, we're on the same wavelength. We're, we're into the same stuff. We have the same references and we have the same politics and ethics. And well, so, yeah. The funny thing is you, like, I had this idea of DIY, like too, too much to a core and you would, you had like an art guy that did art for you and like a mastering guy and some of these sort of like step up from just doing everything yourself. And that was a helpful uh, thing to see, like maybe things don't need to look trash. Like you need to put some production value and I've learned to Photoshop better since then, oh, but cool. I've learned not to do every layout myself for the sake of production value. Yeah. I just, I just fucked up so much stuff, you know, that I finally was like, man, I gotta, I gotta work with people who know what they're doing. And luckily they were also punks and doing it, you know, they were doing it DIY as well. So, you know, there's a network of, you know, DIY punk businesses, shirt printers, Econo press, you know, the printer, yeah. you know, you can work with all these people that are, that are punks and have the same ethics, you know, but still they have the specialty, you know, they, they know how to make quality stickers that aren't going to run or come off a, you know, come off a wall once, once stuck or whatever. So, you know, work with them, you support their business, you know, and they'll, they'll support you down the road and, you know. Hell yeah. Do it together. Know, do it together. Yep. That, that's a message for today, kids. Instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of me DIYing and doing embarrassing layouts and then having to mail, like I tried to take on too much stuff and, uh, I think I still need to take that lesson and get a layout person. That's not me. I, I've been utilizing this guy in Canada who does a good job. Uh, a shout out to Tommy Wilson. He, he does. Oh, really dude, cool. Tommy Wilson stuff is so good, man. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been, I've been trying not to do too much stuff, although I'm probably going to do the no comply layout, but yeah. Uh, 
Well, you, you know, Steelworks, John Yates, he used to do some stuff for me. And you'll notice that a lot of the, the, the punk art guys from the 80s, so John Yates, Martin Sprouse, who does three chord politics, they, they all are following Tommy, you know, and, and Tommy is also following them. And so, you know, if you're checking out their artwork, you can see like this old generation of maximum rock and roll, John Yates doing all the old alternative tentacle records and you know like a lot of the early stuff um it's following tommy you know and tommy's following them and so there's this kind of like cool conversation going on between generations that you get to follow on instagram now and stuff too you cool. know and they really respect what tommy's doing like where he's feeding everything through fax machines yeah. and stuff i mean it's nuts man that process that that he does <laughs> yeah i i appreciate that because when i didn't know what i was doing i did a lot of stuff to physical and then back to digital and then when I learned Photoshop a lot better, I'm like, why would I ever touch anything physical? But uh, then I hear that he's doing all this like 20th generation photocopy of the same thing is pretty wild. That yeah. it, Did you, did you see the thing where he, he did a bunch of photocopies? He did a, a few fax runs and then he put it out and he shot it with fucking BB gun a couple of <laughs> times and, stuff, and then put it back and scanned it in and then, and then framed it. I was like, damn, man, that's like, that's hardcore. And know? I think he's gone to art school. So he, he's, he's learned the stuff that I've not learned. And I probably <laughs> should know about layouts because I'll do something and I'll put it together and I'll think it's perfect. And then someone's like, why did you do this? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's sick, man for sure. He's got his own thing going, which is cool to see. Cool. Well, I know I went off topic there and was trying to wrap things up. Um, yeah, I, uh, I gotta go ahead and sign off fellas. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's, I think we can close this for all of us. Uh, okay, three, cool. three hours isn't, isn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> Th thanks guys for having me, man. Yeah. Yes. Thank yeah, you for awesome. fucking joining us, man. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, after this is done, you know, send me an email. Let, let me know what you guys are doing, like music wise and release wise or whatever. And, you know, what, definitely. Uh, yeah, For sure, is, dude. I'm, a, I'm always into like learning about new stuff and checking out what people are doing. So well, I'm going to hit the stop button in a minute and then we can continue to discuss on here if you all have time. But uh, I'll just officially close out uh, episode five. Thanks so much for uh, joining us, Max. Uh, yep. you're, you're killing Thanks, it. Thanks, Rockers. 20. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you everybody for your support and thank you, Will, for all your hard work and teaching me what it means to do a punk label in uh, the 21st century, which I'm slowly learning. Yeah, I think your stuff seems as strong as it ever was, so I, I'd say 2021 is going to be a, a banner year for 625 coming back into the world and uh, oh. I can't wait to see what happens. Yeah, Th thank you everybody. Hey, shout thank out Lisa one more time. Lisa, Lisa. Lisa. Yeah, ebullition Hell for yeah. life, man. <laughs>